So if you think that we're only having uh, an influence here, you're quite mistaken. Because what we do here is going to have a tremendous effect as examples to others. And at the uh, state of the city, which I think four of us were at, somehow they put Bob Ray and I with a table of police commanders. And I asked Fernando, who was for our own protection, <laughs> to, uh, to give some morality to those commanders. And he said it was a little of both. Uh, but just so you know, there are eyes on us, but not eyes on us saying, what are you going to do? But eyes on us to say, we need some help, and we need your guidance. So once again, people are looking towards us. People may be looking towards us in a political manner, but I know all of us are looking towards ourselves in a moral manner. So I think that is the more important thing, because if we act in a moral manner, the politics will follow us no matter what we decide. So thank you all, all for bringing your inside, both the heart as well as the moral compass, this morning and every time you leave your homes. I didn't have anything to say, but you put me in front of a microphone. And I have <laughs> no, I'll just I'll echo what, what's already been said. Believe it or not, the number of people that I run into each week who say, how are things coming with the task force? How are things coming? People are interested. Some of them are, like many of us were in the beginning, still a little uh, apprehensive about what we're doing. I'm not sure that we're on the right track. But I've been glad to you know, report to them that I think we're doing great work and frankly, we're doing a lot better than I thought we would be doing by this time in our process. Uh, I really do believe that. If I didn't, I wouldn't say it. Of course, we still got a lot more work to do. Uh, this will help us get there, I think. So, uh, hope you will enjoy this day and, and come away with something that we can use in the future. And I just want to echo what our, my co-chairs have said. You know, Thank you all for taking the time to participate in this committee, but taking the time to be here with us today. We are going to make some revisions because I know some people have to leave early, so we're going to try to be out at 3 o'clock. Um, and I know we can do that because we, with all of you here, there's so much strength in this room and so much experience that I know that we can accomplish what we're looking to do today. And I really appreciate that. So next on the agenda is Esther Tucker. So, Esther. Thank you, Rosa, to each of the co-chairs and all of you present. Uh, wow, what a way to start a, a Monday morning. But echoing what has been said, thank you for your commitment, the engagement of your head and your heart and your hands and feet because you've been moving. Uh, as we looked at designing this day, I thought of an emerging agenda. Aligned with the stated agenda, which the public noticed. So we're not deviating from that. But we want the agenda always to be in service of you and not the other way around. That you feel felt feel captive to a rigid agenda. So you've got a lot of papers in front of you, and there's an audiovisual hook up with a computer. I have an iPad, there's seven flip pads and markers and uh, People have laptops and phones. Uh, I want to invite you to take a breath, because we're only going to use that as need, and we're being recorded. <laughs> so we're only going to use that as needed. I'm going to, and already I'm going to simplify some things away from here uh, so that we can be engaged here. Uh, I'm also going to invite you uh, a few times throughout this morning to change your seats. Uh, I'm not going to make you do it. I don't want to invite you to do it. Um, so, as the co-chairs uh, looked at some objectives, let me just read very, very briefly, rather than putting it up there, just very briefly, it won't come as a surprise. One, we want to continue to learn and commit to some practices in service of effectively addressing these difficult issues. We're going to have, we're going to open the morning in a way of inviting your voices around difficult issues that you see. 
and more fully engaging each of you uh, as task force members and then on to engaging stakeholders throughout our community. Second, want to develop a shared understanding and common definitions for advancing racial equity. Just saying racial equity doesn't do very much. Inviting your understanding around racial equity is how we begin to frame something that works for Fort Worth. Third, understanding some promising best practices in other cities to enhance racial equity in light of the city of Fort Worth's cultural strengths, specific challenges, and specific opportunities. Again, we want to craft something that is going to emerge in the form of recommendations in the near future, but something that's responsive to Fort Worth. Identify opportunities to use a racial equity tool and data to drive results tailored to Fort Worth. You're already involved in a significant amount of that around disparities in each of the subcommittees. We're going to create some space for the subcommittees to get together and look specifically at the difficult issues and emerging recommendations from the subcommittee perspective. And then last, identify emerging issues that can be uh, refined uh, in the very near future. All right. So I want to invite a reflection by each of you, and then some conversation at your table. And you've got some blank index cards if you don't have a tablet or something to write with. I want to invite you to uh, kind of let go of some things. How many have a lot on your mind and on your shoulders and in your heart? It's a lot going on. We have a lot of roles and tasks to play. And as the rabbi mentioned, this is this is very big. It's not just uh, in our immediate what in our in our immediate present, but uh, from a global perspective as well. We're playing a part. So let me see if I can invite you. Now, I feel kind of feel a little stuck to this. Uh, this podium, I'm going to do my best to stay here. Uh, so if you see me wringing my hands and doing this, I'm just trying to, trying to stay up here. So I'm okay? I can wander a little bit? Okay, all right. Um, there you go. So there's some processes that we want to use, and the process is like the agenda. It's in service of fully engaging you. Whatever the recommendations might be, from my perspective as a consultant, as I listen to the co-chairs, those recommendations need to have your hand print and heart print on them. Something that the task force can own fully. That's no small matter because y'all don't really agree on everything. <laughs> now y'all do a good job of agreeing in mass mostly, but I, I, I listen to you individually and you don't, you're not agreeing about everything, which is great. If you were agreeing, I would be a little worried. How many agree with everything your best friend say? Right. So it's not about agreeing. It's about aligning. How many remember the metaphor we used at the beginning about the elephant and the five blind men? Six blind men. <laughs> Depends on what part of the country I'm in, whether it's five or six. Some, <laughs> five doesn't work in some countries. Six is odd even. So six blind men. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> Keeping that metaphor in mind, each of us, each of you, have a perspective based on your lived experience, based upon what you cherish, what you value, how you see the world. We need that. We don't need you to let go of that. So it's not about agreeing, it's about aligning. How do we align our different perspectives to create some powerful recommendations? So here's the first question and reflection. Give you a few minutes to think about. Uh, Actually, I'll put them together. And then I'm going to invite you to talk about it at your table. And you reasonably might want, we want to invite someone from this table to join that table so we'll have uh, three. Well, someone just came in. So uh, you're welcome. Robert is here. So Robert, Robert, sit with me. Yeah. Yeah. Whichever. Yeah. There's some, you know, some equity, some equity at the distribution of people at the table. And here's a 
I'm going to write, I put them up on the wall, but let me just, I'll just say the questions and let them, let's see if they can resonate with you in a way that you can capture some of your, your ideas. You've been working in subcommittees, and part of the charge is to begin to frame some actionable items that can become recommendations. Now, being mindful of your subcommittee role and your experience in the whole task force and what you've been hearing, what you've been thinking, what you've been feeling. In light of all that, what are some possible recommendations already bubbling in you? Someone was to call you up and say, what are you thinking of possible recommendation from this task force might be. So give thought to your subcommittee, but you're not limited to the subcommittee. You can look, think, reflect beyond that. And in particular, you, you've been serving for a while. What's really been, what's been resonant, what's been connecting with you as you listen to the news and read the paper and have conversations? What are some recommendations that are bubbling in you? And I think I will just give you the one, that one question and let you, let you work with that for a while. So um, I'm going to invite just a moment of silence because some of us can't really reflect if there's voices all around us. So just a few minutes of silence. And you don't have to do an essay on it. What's the tagline? What's the, what's the highlight? What's the recommendation? Just capture a few words and make that number one and go to number two. And see, see how many you might have come up with. Okay. I want to invite you at each table. Let's see if we can do this in about 15 minutes. Not a huge rush, but we'll see. Um, no. Yeah. Do it about 15 minutes. Take about five minutes. See how five minutes work. And invite every voice at the table to share what they've reflected on. Just the, the bullet points. Uh, and feel free to add to that. Um, but just let's take just maybe about five minutes, five or six minutes, uh, to share, making sure every voice has a turn. And then after that. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna time you on the five minutes, so you, you can go over a little bit. Uh, but after that, I want each table then to summarize rec some potential recommendations and some difficult issues and questions on the flip pad sheet. So uh, get someone at each of your table who writes a print, reasonably legible. I know I know a few of you, so you. you Cannot volunteer. <laughs> so we want to be able to read it from around the room. Uh, so uh, any questions about that? Just going to share your reflections. And then after everybody has shared, kind of capture them as succinctly as you can. And then we're going to have a, a large room discussion on them. And so each can see what the others are doing. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So this will take us to a break, um, but let's kind of get a sense of the reflections and, and thoughts at each table using the flip pad sheet as a um, kind of a catalyst. I want to invite you to do two things. Well, I'll do it. I'll keep it simple. Uh, who wants to start? And just take a, a minute or two to, to go over what you've written, and then invite your your your. Uh, fellow members at the table, any comments they want to add to that? And then we're going to open up to the whole room. Okay. Uh, why don't you just do, go through everything you have? Okay, okay but this is what we think is the keystone of everything we're doing. If we don't get an acknowledgement by city officials and power brokers and the work that racism exists and has a history of norms that exhibited values that have resulted in disparities in marginalized communities, we might as well give up. I mean, all recommendations that 
power brokers um, and the city officials had to have a commission to examine their own biases and privilege as they go into reading our report. That they are willing to be open to doing that before they read the first word of our report. It's key to understand that our report won't end anything. It will launch something. Because if we don't, our process shouldn't be the end. It should be the beginning of something. It, it, can, can I ask a question? Is there a way that we can bring each of them up here so it's easier for everyone to see? That's what I did. And we need to acknowledge the interconnectivity of all our subcommittees. The center is racial and cultural disparities, but all of these are connected. I mean, we found out on the housing subcommittee that saying we need to meet with the economic development people. And then we'd learn a little bit more and say, oh my gosh, this is transportation. Well, it all. All of them are connected. And if, if we're going to have strategies that work, we're going to have to look at housing, transportation, and economic development, maybe look in this triangle for strategies within that triangle. And then education with criminal justice and, and health. I mean, there are all ways, several ways you can set up triangles of interconnectivity to start looking for strategies to, to help solve some of the issues that have that are arising in our various subcommittees, but they all touch on one another. And just as there's a, an interconnectivity of oppressions, there's an interconnectivity of the issues that those oppressions raise up. And we need to acknowledge that. that our housing subcommittee can't solve housing all by itself because it's impacted by transportation, by criminal justice. Um, all, all of those issues. So we need to name that right out and say that out loud. And then we need to frame our recommendations in a way that will be heard, owned, and actionable, and, and commit to accountability. And like I say, our report doesn't end anything. It launches a whole new process. So, you all want to add to that? Any, uh, okay. any, uh, any questions? Uh, not just, you know, way long questions, but any, any questions or comments on this report while it's fresh? Look, I, I, just, I just have a comment that I want to make. You know, when we started talking with the community, we started with a blank page. We got to now we're to committees and forming committee structures. So we're making this progress that Rosa talked a little bit earlier about and how much progress my brain talked about. So just to touch base with the group, would you then validate just from this first report out that we have the right committees in place? And if you don't think we have the right committees in place based on the model, the model that's been drawn here, then what other, what other committees do we need? The highlighted part on that is that every single one of them, as we have spoken about, are interconnected, though maybe not showing the arrows. But in all of these issues, one is affecting the other, from economic development, education, key pieces of everything. It's all totally interconnected. And we agree with, I'm hearing by silence, that probably we agree we have the right ones, and their interconnectivity is apparent. And I captured that question. Thank you. Any other questions for this first group? Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we first. The first question was. <laughs> the first question was just like frame actionable item recommendations. Actions, uh, whatever you know, what we're thinking and hearing and feeling, and I think we all can agree that this is even as we've broken into our committees, it's still big, it's still complicated. Yes, we've made some awesome progress. We are all 
uh, I don't want to say all committed to the charge, but we have some amazing people at the table committed to making sure we continue the progress. Uh, we agreed on that. Uh, something else that we talked about as far as uh, thinking and uh, feelings, uh, you know, the advocacy, you know, the policy change, uh, access. I have to my uh, Ratana is on my health committee, so it, kind of like you talked about, Katie, with the cross, the cross-functional, the, the interconnectivity is on the, the health committee. We're trying to discuss access, but access, we ended up talking about transportation. So now we need to talk to the transportation committee and, and the recommendations for all of that. Um, and even identifying, I know we talked over here about, you know, the, you know, the certain population of people understanding that there's issues. I think in our learning, we need to have to recognize our own. We use white privilege, but our own privilege. Because when you think about access to health care, we can all just pick up the phone and call and make an appointment. And think about transportation, that being an issue, how I, we were sharing that if something happened to my car, the number of resources I had before I even had to get to the team. You know, I could get a rental car. I could, you know, you know I, I mean, I could call a friend and borrow a car. I could, you know, Uber, Lyft. So even before I would have to even, I don't, wouldn't even know how to get on the T right now. So just acknowledging our own privilege in having access to health care and transportation. And then the second one, uh, when we talked about the, the just kind of getting rid of the recommendations but what difficult issues or questions are not addressed, I don't know that we talked about, as we form our list of recommendations, who's going to fund it? <laughs> when you think about some of the recommendations that we have as far as uh, the health committee, we were thinking about, okay, well, you know, we all have smartphones. We talk about the population that still will get Star Telegram, and they're not on social media, and we're missing everyone. But we identify that the majority of people do have a phone. And how can we get resources that are available that some a demographic of people might not be aware of? How can we do this text message? But then who's going to pay for that? Who's going to, you know, create all that? So I think our, our, our other question was, regardless of how many recommendations that we put on this paper, actionable, great ideas, those things we can implement, I think we have not discussed economics. We have not discussed the funding of any of this because it can all sound fine, it can sound fine and good, but where's the money going to come from and who's going to determine what recommendations are going to get certain funds, if any of them, I don't say any of them get funded, but we discussed where is this money going to come from, who's going to pay for it. So. Excellent. Anything else? Matrix for success. Oh, yeah. We talked about the, the, the metrics as well. So the metrics, you know, uh, Katie, you talked about it. We talked about it here is, you know, how have we really talked about the issues before the forming of the, of the task force, you know, identifying the fact that we have an issue here in Fort Worth. And not only looking at the history of that, making that, the making that, that identification, of, you know, we do have a problem in recognizing that <laughs> to now we can move forward, but how are we going to measure our success? How are we going to measure our success when it comes to the list of recommendations that are put forth? Are we going to have another committee that's going to come back every six months, every 12 months, and, and go down that list of recommendations to see what progress? Accountability. Accountability. Yes, yes. So that be that. Ladies, do you all have anything else to add? Excellent. Any, uh, the larger group, any questions for this group? Questions or comments on what you've just heard? My own, my own comment is on the funding side. I know it's crazy to say, but I don't think we need to worry about that. Why not? Because I think our job is to make a recommendation and our leaders figure out how to fund it, if they agree with it. I mean, that's just me. I, I well, that's just comes back to the buy-in we've got to get. Yeah. I, I don't know if we're so concerned about each recommendation of how much it's going to cost, but again, if you think about the recommendation that we're going to present, there's a dollar sign that's oh, I agree. attached to one. I, I so agree. it's not a matter of saying how much it's going to cost, because what we don't want to hear is, here's a list of 50 recommendations, but 25 of them cost X amount of dollars, so oh, we can only concentrate on this 25. And we spent time coming up with 50. So I don't know if it's too deep that we have to worry about who's going to fund it, but we know that these recommendations are going to cost, and we haven't discussed that. Uh, no, I, I agree. Or are we going to have a conversation, too, about as we look at recommendations, what are tied to funding and what are not tied to funding? Is that going to be a full 
forum or a, an opportunity for all of our committees to come together to look at that. And part of that question is, what's the cost of not doing it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, the other part of that is what partners are out there in the city that we can partner together to leverage dollars. Uh -huh. Exactly. What's available? What's available? All right. What do we know about at this point? That sounds like we're going to be into 2020. <laughs> Excellent, though. Excellent question. Who's next? Come on. Come on. I wrote it. Fernando for 
them, them to present to the individuals, or in our cases, as, as we're starting to talk about subject matter experts in our committees, then we'll be addressing those specifically with those people that we're going to uh, talk about. I would just add to that that if we want to know what is the percentage of African Americans, Asians, or whatever, like we in jail, and what is the percentage of, of um, how the sentences are handed down. I think what we're doing is we're kind of asking broader questions. And what we need to be is respectful of the people that are coming to present. And we need to say, we want to know what are the disparities in how you pick up the trash? What is the frequent schedule? So that kind of thing. But we need to be more intentional in how we ask, because they're doing shotgun approach in some cases. And what we know, we kind of know what we want to know. And so what we want to know is this. So I think we go from, let's just don't do so much broad requests, but do specific requests. We know what we want to know, so let's just ask it. Exactly. That's right, because they can't get to it unless we tell them exactly what we're looking for. What was that? They can't get it to us if we don't tell them. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So is there a very specific statistics, you know? Is there a, a mechanism for a brainstorming activity within ourselves of all of these different issues that we could begin to have questions formulated while we're here? Yes. Yeah. I think there's some ways to do that. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can do that. Yeah. So say that again. Let me quiet. Well, in the areas in which we're focused on, um, the subcommittee areas that if we all had a brainstorming session even today, it wouldn't be only these questions would be asked, but it would give us an opportunity to try to brainstorm of all the different questions we ourselves have in these areas. And, you know, and then that those questions also guide who comes to the task force meetings and then they're prepared in their responses. And then any other questions are just in addition to that particular information. Not, you can't ask any other questions, but at least a, a, a base that. I think our thought process should be that we're all in one discussion, we're all trying to come to a good solution of what we're doing. And to the degree that we can be as specific as we can around all of that. I think we have to do that and be respectful of the people who are coming. So when they leave, they feel like they met our goals and we feel like they gave us truth information. So it, it's one of those respect and, and just make sure that we're being specific enough so people can give us what we need. Well, let me get one, one, just a lens of clarity for that and then to invite Jennifer's voice. So what I'm, what I'm hearing in that excellent recommendation around the questions and thinking of the, of the most recent experience there's a level of clarity that comes from experience with a particular system. So I would think that a lawyer in Tarrant County would be able to craft a very good question for the DA. I would think that an administrator, a principal uh, within the ISD, knowing that culture, can craft a good question. So part of what I'm hearing that is, how do we use our collective intellect uh, we, we invite those broader questions, but we need some kind of vetting system with people who are knowledgeable about the system so they can frame those questions in a way they're going to be answered. Uh, and then no, no reflection on our VA. A lawyer is going to be very good at not answering the question you don't ask. So, so that's it. So how do we use our collective, and not only the task force members, but the resource people we can call on as well to make sure those questions are, are crisp. Okay, so, Jennifer. Well, so back to that most recent example and, and what we're saying about as far as the questions and I'll admit once we got in there, I felt unprepared because I didn't know, I saw it on the agenda, I was thought, well, this on the agenda, but I didn't know what to expect. So I didn't know what you all have made as coaches or if you had or for another what you prepared her for, or what asked her to get to. And maybe my mind would have been in a different place. But I do think, you know, if we can then get you, you know, 
questions before the, those our task force meetings and there's a speaker we, we see that on the agenda we submit our question I think that's, that's on us but I think it would also help if we know a little bit more about when you guys are bringing the speakers to us how, why I guess and what what do you and think I can tell you that that we as co-chairs will talk about that at our next co-chair meeting so that we can set up a criteria of what we want to hear and what are the disparities that we think may happen and then also send it out to you all so that you all can have those questions. Get some maybe information from him up, up uh, like the front end so that we can share that with you all so that y'all can be better prepared. Thank you. Have you had some basic standard questions that you're kind of asking people? But, uh, let me respond in respect to the specific situation okay. of uh, this attorney uh, and explain how it came about and each of these situations has been different, uh, so it's hard to generalize. But in this particular case, the task force requested that we invite the sheriff. Right. And I had placed multiple phone calls, had spoken with several members of the staff, have sent several follow-up emails. I have never gotten a direct response. The sheriff knows several People have followed up directly with him. He knows that this task force wants him to speak. He has not responded. And that's, that's a response. That's a response. Uh, now, uh, we were in the meeting with Mayor. We had a discussion, the co chairs had a discussion with, uh, and Charles Boswell was there, uh, about. Uh, uh, the redistricting idea, and we got to talking about how we can get the sheriff to come out. The mayor agreed to contact the sheriff, Mayor Price. Uh, and, and Rose is going to try to reach uh, uh, Judge Whitley as a way to get the sheriff to come and talk to us. Uh, so it's not for lack of effort that, that he hasn't arrived to, to speak to this group. Uh, so I never got a chance to talk with the sheriff about what we wanted him to, to say because he never responded. Now, in the course of the same conversation, the mayor said, by the way, you really ought to get Sharon Wilson to come and talk to your group. And we said, great. And I can tell you, I, I, I sent her an email, she didn't respond. I sent an email to her assistant uh, a few days later at 8 o'clock at night. And by 8.20, she had agreed to come and speak to the task. And she, and then I called her the next day. I said, uh, Sharon, we need the task force would like to hear from you about disparities that are attributable to race and culture. And can you talk about this and that? And she said, Whoa, this is a setup. No, no, it's not a setup. These are these are good folks, and they want to hear from you. And and I think I actually think they'll respond very favorably because you've done some good things. And she said, Well, if it's a criminal, I'm going to put them behind bars no matter what. And I said, Doesn't. I, we understand that. We expect you to do that. But we want you to give us statistical evidence about what you're doing, not only within your office, she was perfectly comfortable talking about her own office, but I was talking about the criminal justice system more broadly. Are, is there any t uh, tendency for us to put people of color behind bars at a greater rate than we're putting others behind bars? What data do you have to share with us? I think, I think that's what the task force is going to want to hear. And, you, and they're going to want to ask you questions. And, and so that was the background that I gave you. Now, in, in that instance, the suggestion to bring in the DA didn't come directly from the task force. It came from the mayor and the co-chairs. And the co-chairs talked about it. And they wanted to set it up so the task force could have a meaningful discussion with this attorney. But I think Rose is right. If, if you have specific questions, that you want to pose in advance to any speaker, then I think uh, we share them with staff and with the co-chairs. The co-chairs meet every month on the first Monday, I think it is, uh, and and they have they, they usually meet for at least a couple of hours, uh, and they get into all the issues that they think ought to be put on the agenda for the next meeting. So that would be a great uh, way to, to, to be sure that we pose the right questions to all the speakers. So even if they don't answer all your questions, at least they, 
uh, provide you with, a, with a, a, a good basis upon which to pose additional questions to them, and they might want to follow up uh, even after the meeting. And we've had that happen with some of our speakers that have followed up with because they didn't have the email. So, so, the uh -huh. so sure. even now, if you, if you have additional questions you want to pose to, to Ms. Wilson, yeah. we'd be happy to convey them to her, and I'm sure she'll, she'll be responsible. So how, how far in advance are the speakers saying, you all, we've received email to just say, you know, April, May, June, July, here are our prospective speakers, and if you have any questions of them, submit them to right, us. Right now, I, I don't think we have any speakers uh, okay. in, in the queue. Okay. If there are other folks you'd like, to, we, we're still trying to get uh, sure. the sheriff, uh, but if there are other folks you'd like to come and speak to the whole task force, I think that'd be great. One of, one of the, one of the benefits of having the six committees is that you now have a bunch of uh, subject matter experts uh, associated with each committee that you can bring to have, I think, perhaps even more meaningful discussions. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there may be some, some value in having some uh, particular speakers come and speak to the whole task force. But I think there, there, there could be even greater value from having uh, more folks come and speak to the committee. I, I agree with that. Because that's, those are the resources that can help you all make the recommendations to the branch of those task force. Excellent. Next. Actual conflict about whether it have or not, right? So that was that remains on the plate. The education committee, Bob was speaking of this. There have been a whole lot of prior studies and reports and suggestions that address racial disparities in education, but haven't been implemented. So we're gonna we're in the position now of recommending them again. So what's going to be different this time, I guess, is a concern. When it got to the difficult questions, and we, we talked about this a little bit already, the way I formulate the question is, what price is the city council willing to pay to achieve equity, diversity, inclusiveness, what we're all about? Now that's... Partly that's dollars and cents because we're going to get to at some point in this process we're going to be looking at disparities in service delivery, right? And as I was suggesting in my table, we're not we're not going to get we're not going to bring the service levels down in any part of town 
to bring them up another, right? Isn't that logical? We're going to need to be investing more resources in the, in the neighborhoods that are disadvantaged. And so we don't have to necessarily address how that gets done, but that's, if you're, if you're not willing to make that investment when it gets down to it, don't tell me you're really concerned about disparities in service. That's just dollars and cents. There's another price. It's the political capital that's involved. And um, I don't want to be a dead horse, but one of the things that really rankles me is the whole SB4 debate. And there was a way to get there with pro bono lawyers. It wasn't going to cost anything out of pocket. But it was going to cost somebody an endorsement down the road when I run for another office, perhaps. Or maybe even the same one I have. I don't know. But again, if, if you're not willing to pay that price, you know, what, what are we doing this for? So, Especially if you're going to ask our federal you're going to ask for folks to join you in reaching out to our federal representatives to come up with better solutions for our DACA student, DACA recipients, and our dreamers. That's very frustrating. To say. I think the bottom point is just a continuing emphasis on how we provide equitable access to all elements of the community decision-making process. And I was just going to make a comment that still goes back to voting. Yeah. We need, if, if the voters would vote, that's the voice that the political officials will listen to. As yeah. long as we don't vote, it's a silent voice. The only 25,000 people that have voted in Tarrant County as of yesterday at 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. That's right. 25,000. All parties. I, I went in to vote. Really? Yeah, yeah, I got there at 4 o'clock. They said I was the only one that walked in. Oh my God. I'm surprised. I was very cold yesterday. So, I mean, we, we need to stand up to vote. And we need to get that message out there. <coughs> well, they don't perceive there will be a cost to not doing this. Exactly. Well, the cost is, you know, you can't change something. <laughs> what is it with the, well, the you don't change your habits, you're not going to change anything. Yeah. They don't see that. Any other feedback from the table? Um, to caveat off of the how to improve access, our table kind of talked a lot about the state of the city uh, with the mayor, and we kind of talked about how that's more of an inclusivity type of, if, if you're anybody who's anybody in the city, you're there, tickets are $150, $200 to get in, you have to be a sponsor, yada, yada. People in our community don't have access to attend that event, or it's during the day, you're missing two or three hours of your work day. So that's kind of what we were talking about as far as improved access, and that's just a, an example of it. That's not. No, I'm, and I'm sorry, because he was asking me questions. So I don't know what I've been trying to talk about. We're talking about say, city, so what the city. So just events kind of like that, where maybe some of our people in the community would have benefited from going to, maybe not benefited, but improved access. They, they otherwise don't have access to go. So. They do roaming town halls. Yeah. It's, it's also one of our suggestions. In the yeah. How often do they do the Roman Cal Halls? Because they do them all over the community. All the time. All the time. All the time. Yes. She usually does them with the, yeah. the respective council, council member and the mayor. Yeah. So that's when those community can come to them. Yeah. So they're out there. Uh, and I would just add one more thing. Just like the task force works uh, are interconnected, there's interconnectivity between. Uh, the action or inaction of our elected officials, the very low voter turnout, which we talked about, and a large population of the community that feel that whether they vote or not, it will not make a difference. So somehow there has to be a change in the culture for people in the community to take ownership for what happens in the community and, and, uh, and turn that desire for a better future into action because indifference truly is the enemy of a community that wants to change for the better. 
and I will tell you the North Texas Commission, and for them, you may correct me for some of this, uh, has got a, an advocacy program that they're putting out to get out the vote. Not telling you what to vote on, but to get out the vote. And one of the studies that they did is um, if, the, if you work for a business, if the owner is allowing you to have time or telling you you've got an hour off or whatever to vote, it's 80% it goes up. 8%. And so they're pushing this throughout North Texas to get voters out. But that's just one resource that's doing something. It's everybody else that needs to be doing something too. Others from the broader area. Charles, it seemed like you were going to go back to something. Oh, there was, this, there was this one. Okay. What about education? Something else? Well, they did, just uh, the education committee. Bob was mentioning, they, they are reviewing all sorts of prior reports and task forces that have made recommendations, but those have not never gone into it on topic with the racial equity. So the question is, what, what's going to be different? Yeah, we've talked a lot about recommendations and then implementation, but there's that key middle piece. Somebody has to decide that a recommendation should be implemented. And if, if previous studies and, and, and recommendations have been made, but there's been no action taken on it, what's going to be different this time if recommendations are made? Right, again, it, it comes down to the, the, the leaders in the city, those that are in decision-making powers, having the will to take action on recommendations. We well, talked about prioritization, how do we prioritize the final recommendations, and how do we develop the sustainability model for them as well. So I think that's that's out there. Now one thing that struck me when the police chief and the minister were there was um, it was said that recommendations that were made in the wake of the Rainbow Lounge raid had all the recommendations that the LGBTQ community had come together had been implemented. And yet, the recommendations of the minister's report, not very much had been done. And I'm sorry, it was just really obvious the LGBTQ community is largely white. And it, I mean, just to me, it was a very stark difference. That one was every recommendation had been implemented, and the other, not much was happening. There was one that had not been implemented, and it's still outstanding. One out of? There was 19, wasn't there? Yeah, 19, 19 out of 20 were implemented. Yes. Okay. And the one that wasn't implemented, there were particular legal uh, barriers to that. So all those that were actionable? The were one that wasn't implemented was for the city to pay for reassignment surgeries. That's, that was, I knew there was some reason to do it. But yeah. those that could be done, have right. Been done. Right. 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 Um, and I'm just asking a question, is that maybe because the media was also on this so much? Because if the media is covering it, then sometimes it's well, done. And I'm just, I'm just not even so. afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, yeah. the more media that's involved, it seems like that's oh, a good I definitely think that's a piece but, of but it. And then the voting power with that's proceeding. Yeah, I know yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. And the power. Power. In the case of the... The diversity task force, which dealt with the issues associated with the Rainbow Lounge incident, I think I think we can probably attribute the success to, to several factors. And, and and some of these recommendations were controversial, uh, and and there was pushback from the community and from the uh, from individual members of the city council. I think uh, I would give a substantial amount of credit uh, to the leadership of the diversity task force. Uh, and particularly to, to John Nelson, uh, who said this is a community issue. Uh, there was there were there were forces from outside of Fort Worth who wanted to take over the process, and John said no, no, this is a right. That's just you were involved, uh, Robert. You were involved. So others, I'm sure, in the room were involved in, in this process. Uh, John said this is a Fort Worth issue. Fort Worth is a good community. And we're going to stand up, and we're going to address the problems. Uh, and he said, you folks from Dallas, appreciate your interest, uh, don't meet you. Uh, ironically, John said, moved to Dallas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
he stood up for Fort Worth, uh, and, uh, and, and that made a difference. I think it made a difference that uh, we had the ear of the city manager at the time it was Dale Fisler. And, and I made sure that he received regular reports and, and that he felt comfortable with the recommendations that we were making. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Nelson and others were keeping the council members informed along the way and making sure that when the time came that they would be ready to stand up and vote in support of the recommendations. Uh, and so uh, I think it took all those things and, and, and I think this task force can draw some lessons from, from that experience uh, about uh, making sure that what we recommend will actually be implemented. And I, uh, I, I like the, uh, some of the comments that Lily made uh, about setting priorities. I think we'll be, and this is just one person's opinion, I think we'll be a lot better off with, with a limited number, maybe 10 uh, stretch recommendations that are fully vetted and, and funded that can be implemented within a reasonable time frame, one or two years, I think that'll be a lot more effective than having 100 recommendations that are not funded, for which the responsibility to implement has not been identified. I, I think our credibility would, uh, uh, would suffer. Uh, and so if, if we can figure out uh, a few big recommendations that will have a big impact on this community, uh, to, that, that to the extent they involve uh, financial resources, uh, we've identified the appropriate funding source. It might come from the city. It might come from some other source. Uh, the city might leverage partnerships to get things done. In fact, in all likelihood, that's what it's going to take. Uh, but if we, if we have identified the funding sources and we can say, here is the responsibility, uh, the, these are the folks we're going to hold accountable for getting it done. And Lily's other comment, uh, as I heard it, had to do with sustainability. How do we make sure that this isn't a, a one-shot deal that's forgotten uh, weeks after uh, uh, the task force dissolved? And so we need to make sure that whatever we do is going to continue, that this is just the start. Uh, I think Katie was making that point. This is just the start of the process. How do we make sure we have a process in place? Uh, Arturo is a past chair of the Human Relations Commission, which, which Andy rushed fast. We have a commission, and, and, uh, and Arturo, you'll give me permission to say this. I, I, don't, think, I don't think we've listened to the commission, and, and I don't think the commission has a lot of clout in this community. It, it's, it has a 50-year history. And it was, it was an SSC chair for longer than you really <laughs> should have chaired. <laughs> uh, I chaired it before okay. So you know, I, I, I'm telling you, we've got a, it, a, an institutional a setting in city government to advance this agenda. But we haven't used it. We haven't used it. And, and, uh, and we're talking candidly here. A lot of the issues that the Human Relations Commission brings up are irrelevant. Uh, the task force is, 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 was, was established to, to raise issues that are relevant, that are meaningful, and that's what we ought to be discussing. Uh, we ought not to be engaged in a debate right now, uh, six months after the fact, about some resolution that the uh, Human Relations Commission adopted, and why isn't the city council considering it? That, that's, that's, that's dead. Uh, the time to join the lawsuit has passed. Now let's move ahead. There's, there's a long agenda of things that we can do. So how do, how do we do that? And, and so, in, in respect to sustainability, we've got the Human Relations Commission. How do we make sure the Human Relations Commission is as powerful as any border commission in city government? And has a, a, a voice that if the Human Relations Commission says X, Y, and Z, the council is going to do it. And, 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 and you will have that, uh, that respect that, that, that you deserve. Well, and when we uh, brought up sexual orientation uh, to be a protected class with the yeah. city, uh, they had been trying to do that for eight years prior. And when we went to council to bring this issue up, it was emphatically no. Uh, council voted it down. And 
remember Vanessa Reese Bowling was our chair, our executive director at the time, and we asked her, okay, we know there's an issue, why does it counsel? And because they were not a protected class, when those phone calls came into the office, they told them that you know there was nothing that we could do about it or they could do about it. And I said, but the problem there is that you need to turn around and say, they'll call your council member so that your council member can find out that there are issues. And if you all, some of y'all may remember, may not, the next time we brought it up uh, to city council, there was a gentleman that came out that evening uh, and said that he was gay and he would probably get fired the next day. Well, this gentleman lived in Chuck Silcox's district and he was fired the next day. Chuck did not believe it. Chuck called the owner, and the owner said emphatically he was not going to have a blah, 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 blah gay person working for him. And uh, even though he had a great performance record and so forth, but he was not going to have him working. Chuck Silcox helped us to carry that to fruition to get it fully approved. And he was one of, uh, against it. He was very adamantly against it. So it's communication on both sides. Wow. So you're really beginning to actually dig into strategy cross-cutting implications to all the recommendations. Um, so this is particularly powerful and timely. I just want to name one more thing before we, we still have yeah, we still one have more. Time. One more thing out of this last one. Uh, is it one? I think, yeah, just this group there. Next. One more thing. Uh, excellent presentation. You brought up voting and it, initiatives around the country that's brought up. One thing that I really appreciate how you continue to engage voting, if you just leave it with people need to vote, uh, that sounds like blaming the victim. When you begin to look at what are the proactive strategies to encourage voting, that's, that message will resonate with the community and there are some things you can link up with. But voting it always comes up and whether or not you take it the next step often determines whether or not you engage the voice of the community. Well, and I think one of the important things that I'd like to live up by what Fernando said was that if we don't if we don't say somebody's accountable, if we say people need to vote, if everybody's accountable, then nobody's accountable. We That's need right. to name specific people and bodies that are named who will implement it in our county. Thank you. But it is education towards the individuals on how to how to vote. Exactly. Because we had a gentleman at the uh, chamber come to me, had an issues with some uh, zoning in his business, and I was trying to get him educated on what he needed to do. Well, he instead went to the council and had his three minutes and told each one of them and pointed at each one of them, I voted for you, I voted for you, I voted for you. Well, he did. So his credibility just went out the door. And so it was sort of like, hey, help me, help you. Yeah. So it's education. We're right at the break of break, right following this. Um, just wanted to name around voting. Uh, the question I would pose, whose vested interest in voting uh, data stat statistics staying the same? Um, it's challenging and it's an illusion to think that nobody's interested in voting not increasing. We conversation often suggest that everybody wants more people to vote. That's not true. That's not true anywhere. So who, what are the barriers? What are the adversaries to more voter engagement, to more people voting? If that's, if that's what we need, then we need, to, we need to look under that. Because it's not true that everybody in Fort Worth wants more voters. And I, I don't want to make this more your presentation about breaking. I, I think it was something you read that I got some of that from. So. Uh, <laughs> No, I, you see, and I'm still very concerned about the stop the situ situation, and I don't see people contacting Congress. I don't. And the deadline is Monday? Well, anyway. Once the judges court court I'll go through this quickly since uh, say we're up against the break. Um, well, we talked about in terms of possible recommendations, needing more minority leadership training. We have leadership training in the city. It's very expensive. For the most part, it doesn't include many minorities, which is one reason that uh, a couple of other groups have tried to come up with some leadership training. Uh, and rather than uh, having citizens 
for residents come to the city, uh, we thought there ought to be more mobile services of the city going to the community, uh, to specific places like community centers or libraries or YMCA's or whatever. We hit on the more transportation, and again, as you guys are saying, funding is important. And I don't know, I don't know how you get more funding. I got some ideas personally. Uh, I think you can take funding from other sources, like the crime district. Don't tell the police I said that. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I mean, there, there are ways. There are ways to do this. Uh, so, but we definitely need more transportation and, and, and mass transit. Uh, we need a, a positive plan, maybe even a task force, not you guys, uh, for economic development in Southeast Fort Worth. Uh, those you talked about the workforce uh, mission. Uh, we said there needs to be more emphasis on trade schools, on education, a permanent teen council. Somebody else was talking about looking at younger people getting involved because they're our future. Uh, I think it's already evident from what we've had before, the whole task force and the committee, uh, more diversity in all areas of the police department. I mean, it's still ironic to me that there are major departments, and I was just told they include the gang unit, mm -hmm. uh, the homicide division, uh, SWAT, have no black people in them at all. So, all his parents. But, uh, so, I think we can make that recommendation <laughs> <laughs> without any, any other uh, uh And make sure that the educational funding includes technology. Uh, our schools have to be technologically equipped. And I think we're making progress toward that forward, but we've got to do it in all schools. Uh, and then there has to be more education on housing and home ownership. And with that comes the responsibility of home ownership and the responsibility of dealing with how you keep your home once you get in there. Uh, and, and with a lot of minorities in particular, and low income people in general, it's difficult getting to home ownership, and then once you get home ownership, it's difficult to maintain that, that house. Uh, somehow attacking the gang violence, and I think that may help with more diversity within the gang unit. Uh, we think there ought to be a redistricting commission, whether or not the city council goes along with that or not, but we go up to uh, two new members of the city council after the next census. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, problems that we see, uh, that some task force members are not that committed. And that we need to have uh, an emphasis uh, on culture as well as race that we sometimes get away from. Anything y'all want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, I know the Fort Worth Police Officers Association but, uh, has just stepped down and Manny Ramirez is now taking on that leadership role. Oh, really? Okay. We've got the Keith Carroll and Gilmore as the first vice president. So they have a, a, a minority, you know, two minorities, a woman and Hispanic. The Fort Worth Police Officers Association, Rick has stepped down and Manny Ramirez is now the president and then Carolyn Gilmore is first vice president. Questions from the larger group, or co questions or comments? Hey, Charles? Kind of divided, kind of fast, but some task force members are not committed. Elaborate on that. Right <laughs> <laughs> As co chairs, we've, we've talked, and we, you know, each person here is as important, if not more important. Uh, each person here is as important as anyone else. There's no one here more important than anyone else. We're even more important when we're all 23 of us. Life gets in the way sometimes. I know, unfortunately, I have to do something at any bit 12, but we, we've been talking that it'd be nice if we saw everyone as much as possible because we, we think it would be much more 
effective if we're as one and when we even when you know we don't if, if someone doesn't necessarily and we're not you know pointing fingers god forbid uh but if someone doesn't come uh, on a regular basis or doesn't catch up on a regular basis we can't project to the community seriousness or when someone asks that person a question are they capable of answering that question once again we're not coming to you know uh, try and you know say you're not doing a job or you're not doing a job or I'm not doing a job or we're not doing a job it's for the betterment of all of us and it's a huge commitment we understand that and we wouldn't have asked you if we didn't know that you guys are as committed as everyone else that's what we really need though if you know it's a lot of time it's a lot of effort but I think if we're much stronger together than we are apart that's I know I'm preaching to the choir, but uh... Other feedback? Questions? Thank you for giving me that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're saying, the, the committee chairs, you were talking about the more transportation, more funding, again, with the interconnectivity with all the, the committees, we talked about that as well, the health committee, as far as talking about the T did have a job fair. No one really showed up when they looked at the requirements to drive the bus. You eliminate, you know, so we're going back to looking at, okay, how do we, you know, change some of the policies? Uh, there was another resource for transportation, but the requirements were you could, they could not take you to work or doctor's visit. Were you going to drive up at the mall? I mean, <laughs> so I was just looking at some of the requirements to be able to have access to some of this. So I'm not saying that the T has to change their entire job description of their requirements, but if we can look at that and then you can have more people who might be eligible to drive a bus and they can get more buses in more areas and all that. So it's kind of just like this whole domino. Presidents would be. Yeah. No, no, no. Of that. But we don't have a city. Okay, yeah, that's what I was I mean, as far as I know. Regardless of whether it's Fort Worth or. Yes. Yeah, there is one. There was a There isn't. What did they do? There was one. There is not one. What did they do? What did they do? What did they things did they talk about? Why did it come and go? I was a intimately involved with it, but um, they were only around for maybe three or four years. And it was a lot about getting involved in government. There was a lot of uh, uh, training on how to become more involved, what it meant to be involved. Uh, but I don't remember like any specific recommendations or anything along that line coming out of it. Was that along the same lines as your work? It's been. When did the same time for Frank and Steer Fort Worth start? When did Steer Fort Worth? No, 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 no. Didn't okay. they create the, the, the team one no. at the same time? Okay. The Youth Advisory Board was when it was part of community relations, and when they right. did away with community relations, they did away with the Youth Advisory Board. Sure. So and Becky Haskins used right. to be the yeah, liaison for the Junior City Council. Yeah, uh, the, the district yeah. does have one. Uh, they also have uh, the kids that still meet monthly with the superintendent. Yes, the seat and then the library uh, uh, program also. They don't meet with the superintendent, but the group, the other group does representatives uh, from each each school in the group. I started that again. Uh, but we've been on and off. So we had it before so I started again for our superintendent. So it's still one. Excellent. Uh, let me invite you to take a third yes Walt. I'm sorry, I was apologize to everybody. I had a 
a meeting in Round Rock early this morning, so I wish to get back over here. Round Rock? Oh, I'm sorry. Just down go here? Education committee, that was the only recommendation that we had that we put up there was technology. This wasn't no, no, from, this was up to the table discussion. So we were after lunch, then we would convene in the subcommittees, pick up on any of this that's relevant, and then begin to look at the issues from the subcommittees. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We're on multiple uh, Yeah, that's going to be the question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a little, a little challenging, maybe dividing your time or maybe just sticking with one and then connecting with the others. Let me invite you to pause for about 60 seconds. You've offered a lot, you've heard a lot. Is there anything still remaining in you? What's, anything that you haven't heard, that you haven't given voice to? Pause for about 60 seconds and capture anything remaining that you would like. We're not going to invite you to say it, but I'm going to invite you to write it down. So any area, any issue, any difficulty, any question um, that's still bubbling inside that you want to capture before we go on a break. Well, let's, let's shift a little bit before lunch. Always a little tricky time. Uh, we're going to consolidate it two hours into about 50 minutes. Uh, but we're going to eliminate some things. So we wanted to start out with particular uh, engagement around difficult issues and questions. Uh, we're going to deepen those this afternoon in the land, through the lens of the subcommittee work, uh, and to look at emerging recommendations. And we've got a pretty good uh, summary, thanks to your clear feedback, that we'll be able to offer to all of you as resources for your subcommittee and the broader work. What we're going to spend this time on from now leading us up to lunch are some particular practices that hopefully will engage us in ways that we can not only have some of these difficult questions and conversations uh, in a more productive and healthy manner, but also as we take it to the next level, um, the other uh, stakeholders, how we engage them in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity and actionable uh, items of recommendations, uh, and yet create some, some space, some hopefully productive space for engagement. I've never ever been in an argument. How many have been in an argument today? How many got in an argument before you left home? <laughs> and to really go deep, how many of you got in an argument en route to this meeting and you were the only one in the car? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of conflict is human, right? It's never about avoiding conflict. It's how do we transform conflict in ways that can be productive and helpful. Whether you're talking about a team that you are, including the subcommittee teams, and engaging other stakeholders like the mayor and city council, city manager's office, uh, clergy in our communities, nonprofit execs. Now, just looking around the room, obviously some of you are very adept at that. But even those of us that are real skilled, they're edges, they're challenges. And part of what I'd like to do is to offer you a set of practices that we use with the community conversations in a, in a light way that we've used around the country in some, some light ways and some very, very deep ways. And maybe let me, let me preempt your experience. How many of you remember the movie? Probably have told you this now. Some of you I may have said. That, that's the, the, the dilemma of, of speaking to people you've known for 20 and 30 years or more. Sorry to out you for your age. Um, how many of you watched the movie um, Karate Kid? Raise your hand. And now, yeah, now because it has been a long time, they've got a remake of it. Uh, how many remember the original Karate Kid? I've been telling this story. Okay, so um, Mr. Miyagi, right? Uh, 
young boy from New Jersey, relocates to the West Coast, gets into some conflict early on in school that motivates him to want to learn karate. Is that right? That's kind of a real quick version story. He meets Mr. Miyagi, a school janitor, who happens to be a master of karate. And Mr. Miyagi says, sure, yes, I will teach you karate. Remember that part so far? He shows up at Mr. Miyagi's house, right, eager to learn karate. Do you remember what Mr. Miyagi had him doing the first day? Wax on, wax on. Wax on, wax off. He had him polishing not just one old car, but about 10 old cars out in the yard. And he was waxing, wax on, wax off. But he couldn't just, you know, how many have worked with teenagers? And I should yeah. We all were teenagers, so I said, that's, I'm not picking on that generation, on that group. But he had to tell them exactly how to apply the wax and exactly how to take it off. It was a motion. There was a discipline in the technique of applying the wax, wax on, and wax off. And every now and then, Mr. Miyagi would look at him doing it. Oh, no, no. Straighten your arm, do this, you know, right, right postures, everything. Did it a couple of times, and sure enough, the sun was about setting here. Had, had all those cars shining. Didn't know nothing about karate, but he had, he had waxed the man's car. So he went home, uh, but still a little fire, still wanted to learn karate, shows up early the next day. What happened the next day? Thank the fence. And it wasn't just a gate, it was a fence around the whole property. And he couldn't just slap it on. He didn't have a sprayer. There was a precise motion that he had to make. And he spent the whole day doing it. Fence looked great. He didn't know anything about karate. Left, came back the third day. And, you know, I know, well, some of us wouldn't have showed up the second day. But certainly the third day is a stretch. And what happened on the third day? Porch. Ah. Yeah, sand the porch. And again, he had this this buffer, and it was a certain motion he had to make to take it off and to apply the seal. All day job. By the end of the third day, the porch, the fence, the cars, they all looked new. He didn't know anything about karate, and he was pissed. Oh, got you. <laughs> that's Miles, so that's obvious. Yeah, that's Miles. And he did what a lot of us would do. He confronted Mr. Miyagi and said, I came to you with, with open heart and an eager mind to learn karate, and all you've had me do was be your flunky. I've waxed your cars, painted your fence, and sanded your floor, and I don't know karate. And immediately, Mr. Miyagi opened his eyes. And what happened at that point? Do you remember what happened? Oh. Mr. Miyagi invited him to show him the moves of waxing the cars, wax on, wax off, painting the fence, sanding the floor. Each of those moves, and the reason Mr. Miyagi was so disciplined around it, those were karate moves. Those were the actual step of those basic karate moves. And all he needed to do was to perform. All he had to do was perform, replicate those simple tasks, very simple tasks, in the context of karate. Most of what I do around the country, around engagement, facilitation, uh, racial reconciliation, class reconciliation, all those kind of things that involve humans, there's a lot of high-level strategies and language uh, definitions. I got uh, three pages of them for racial equity. There's a lot of words, but it comes down to how we engage one another. So here's, here's your paint the fence and wax the cars and sand the floor. It's how you listen and it's how you speak and what you do with that intersection. Those are your three kates, those three movements of engagement around this particular racial equity plan. How many are great listeners? Uh, I don't need to say anything else then, right? Listening is powerful. It informs you in a way that you can't imagine and it, it, it has an impact on the people you're listening to. How many have ever been listened to? Really listened to? You know what that feels like to really be listened to? How many of you know that even though they're giving you good eye contact, like some of you are giving me now, 
that if we had a magic marker and we put a circle over the head to see what's actually going on inside, we would really be surprised because nothing that's coming out of my mouth is registering on your attention span. So listening is hard in our culture, but at the core of it, especially interaction with one another, is how well we listen before we form our opinions and calculate what's coming out of our mouth when you be quiet, if we really create a listening space, that's powerful. And the other is speaking. How many have a friend or a family member, a person or two, that you can just speak your mind, say what's up in your heart, in your heart and you know that they're going to hear you, that they're not going to label, analyze, or judge you, but they're going to really listen to you. How many have one or two others in your life that you, that you experience like that? Are most people with you like that? That's the reality check. So how well we listen and how we speak, the kind of environment we create where we can speak our truth. These recommendations will be first animated, not at the council level. They get animated here. If they're not animated when they come out of your mouth and when you engage them together, they're not going to be animated when you pass them off to somebody else. So the courage to speak your truth in ways that respect the truth of others means everything. And once you do those two things, then the work begins. So, so we're going to experience a, a, a couple of different uh, habits, disciplines, to guide you into that. And you've gotten these two before. We've worked with the touchstones a little bit. I'm going to lift up one of them. Before I do that, let me invite someone just to, actually, let me invite six of you. On your table, you'll have the, the touchstones. And these are not, these are, this is kind of reverse homework. I want to continue to invite you to imagine and to look for ways that these simple touchstones can be in service of your charge, of your task, how you engage one another, uh, and in some ways, even how you engage yourself. For a few of us, our best, our worst critics are who? So these relational norms work well even when it's the, we're the ones we're looking at in the mirror. So let me just invite six readers, just loudly, just a, a one at a time, just to name those touchstones, please. Starting with the first one. We listen when we are present as fully as possible. Be here with your doubts, fears, and failures, as well as your convictions, joys, and success. You're listening as well as you're speaking. Suspend the temptation to rehearse what you will say and listen intently and actively. We speak our truth in ways that respect other people's truth. Our views of reality may differ. But speaking one's truth does not mean interpreting, correcting, or debating what others say. Speak using I statements. And if the person reading the third one, if you could read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> we commit to no fixing, advising, saving, or correcting. Everything we do is guided by this simple rule one that honors the primacy and integrity of each speaker. When we are free from external judgment, we are more likely to have an honest conversation with ourselves and learn to check and correct ourselves from within. We suspend our judgments and identify our assumptions. By creating a space between judgments and reactions, we can listen to the other and to ourselves more fully and thus our perspectives. Decisions and actions are more informed. By identifying our assumptions, we can set them aside and open our viewpoints to greater possibility. We ask honest, open questions to hear each other into speech. Instead of advising each other, we learn to listen deeply and ask questions that help others hear their own inner wisdom more clearly. As we learn to ask questions that are not advice in disguise, that have no other purpose than to help someone listen to their inner wisdom, all of us learn and grow. Yourself. I wonder what brought her to this belief. 
I wonder what he's feeling right now. I wonder what my reaction teaches me about myself. Set aside judgment to listen to others and to yourself. Let me invite you to do a couple of things with these words that you've just heard. One is to find one that resonates with you. Find one that you have some lived experience around in your leadership. One that you could easily stand up and, and talk about. Tell a personal story of how you used that particular relational norm well. And you're not going to get a door prize for the best one, so you don't have to take a long time with it. But find one that really resonates with you. And as you do, find one that's a growth edge. In other words, one that challenges you. So you're looking at for two. One that resonates with you and look for one that challenges you. One that if you, if you have the option, you take a black marker and just delete it because you don't want to have to be working with that. Now I want to invite you to each of the tables to share. Share one that resonated, share one that challenged you. Briefly. Now, if, you're, if, if you've selected all six of them as growth edges, um, that's cool. Maybe I can do it a different way and poll, poll your voices around the room around what resonated and what challenged. And then we're going to lift up one in particular. 
Um, we listen and we are present as fully as possible. If that resonated with you, raise your hand. If that challenged you, raise your hand. <laughs> we speak our truth in ways that respect the truth of others. If that resonated with you, raise your hand. If that challenged you, raise your hand. We commit to no fixing, advising, saving, or correcting. If that resonated with you, raise your hand. <laughs> How could I? I could have predicted that a little bit. Uh, if that challenged you, raise your hand. We suspend our judgments and identify our assumptions. If that resonated with you, raise your hand. <coughs> That challenged you, raise your hand. We ask honest, open questions to hear each other into speech. That resonated with you, raise your hand. That challenged you, raise your hand. We turn to wonder when the going gets rough. If that resonated with you, raise your hand. That challenged you, raise your hand. Okay, so a few observations that always happen. Um, one is sometimes the, the touchstone that someone raises their hand to re that resonates is the same one that challenges it. Context is everything. It just depends on where that's being animated. The most powerful one, though, is you see a diversity of responses across all these touchstones, which is strong when you're acting as a team or community because there are assets in different places. People whose lived experience have helped them hold that particular uh, uh, norm well. And so what you want to do in the longer run is how do you align your strategies in ways that takes advantage of your strengths and builds on those weak areas. So some may have a growth edge of a particular norm, but you also have assets and strength in this same uh, setting and team. So here's the one I want to lift up uh, and invite for your consideration as a, as a practice, as a tool, in addition to all of them. But this is a particular one, and a few of you raise your hands up that it resonated. And that's asking open, honest questions. One of the most powerful ways we engage people around differences, race and culture, and a few others we could probably throw on there, is our capacity to ask an open, honest question. So very simply, an open question is a, a question that does not lead to a yes or no, right? It gives space for people to respond. In our culture, many leaders think it's a, I'm say a moral sin, think it is a, an impractical to ask open, honest questions when you know the answer, or when you know where you want to lead people, or where you want to steer people. So the first thing you have to do in asking open, honest questions is let go of your thinking that you know the answer. That's the honest part. Think about it. An honest question is a question you don't know the answer to. That's hard, isn't it, for some? Is that hard to ask a question that's really a question you don't have a clue about the answer. A good friend of mine who just happens to be an attorney. So why would I ask the question if I didn't know the answer or think I know the answer? So what we're seeking to do and framing and crafting our actionable recommendation is be able to tap the intellect, the engage the others in our subcommittees and in this larger committees, tap their collective, their, their intelligence, their lived experience by posing Brief, I'd always like to say brief, open, honest question. If your open and honest question takes longer than a breath, if you have to inhale a few times to ask your question, that's not a very good question. So you want it to be brief, but you want it to be open. You don't want their response to be yes or no. You want to give them space to elaborate. And then the honesty of it, you really aren't leading them. You really want to know their response. And I'll pose this question, but I know what the response is. How many have been in, in settings where you were asked a question, 
And you didn't feel, one, that they cared about your answer one way or the other. I mean, I've been in settings like that. And they weren't mean to you. They weren't disrespectful. But it was just clear they weren't going to do anything with whatever came out of your mouth, right? It wasn't going to impact what happens next. That's not an open, honest question. It takes a lot of courage to ask an open, honest question. It takes a conviction that that other person, your committee member, has something to say. The reason often community people don't respond well to leadership is because they don't think leadership, not only is leadership not listening, but they could care less what comes out of their mouth. And it's modeled and it's demonstrated and people grow up with that posture and community that as a leader, you're not going to listen. And if you're there to listen and you ask a question, it doesn't matter what I say. You're going to do what you do anyway. So open and honest questions at the core of community engagement. So that's what I want to invite you to do. I'm not going to grade you. You're not going to get less lunch if you don't ask you know, many open and honest questions. But I want to invite that as a practice. As you're engaging one another, if someone suggests something, uh, rather than immediately advocating for how you would do it, which is important, except for it kind of knocks out the legitimacy of what they've offered. So an open, honest question says that you're listening, and it opens up the possibility that something might emerge that you couldn't imagine. And I think that's leadership. OK. So here's what we're going to have you do. The second page passed out are habits of the heart. These take it to another level. Those touchstones typically reinforce relational norms and committees, teams, groups, communities. They're really good to helping people uh, engage at the first level. These habits of the heart takes it to, to the stakeholder level. An appreciation of these um, is really kind of what holds uh, our democracy together. We the people, all the people, by the people. And without giving you a lot of history, maybe let me just invite, again, um, readers, five readers, just to read the bold. Okay, I understand that we are all in this together. An appreciation of the value of otherness. Three, an ability to hold tension in life-giving ways. A sense of personal voice and agency. A capacity to create community. Okay. What I'd like to, you to do for the next just two or three minutes, I want you to read these and find one. Make it five minutes. To keep it from being too rushed. But find one of these that you have some of your life stories is in there. Find one that holds some of your life stories. Another way to say that. Find one of these that you would be willing to champion as a race and culture task force member. And look on that, I'm sorry, the, the holes will be, well, you see, the holes are to your right on this one. So find one that has your story in it, or, or one that you would be willing to champion and reflect on. So give you a few minutes just to read them as we uh, turn the corner toward lunch. Find one and then uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll give us uh, the last invitation. <coughs> Next to last invitation. How many of you journal? Journal. Write in the journal. No particular way, but that you capture your thoughts in some way of writing. In fact, it could be recorded as well. How many of you have ever done any stream of consciousness writing? Where you let go of all the attachments and analysis and judgments, just write what's coming to mind and coming to heart. I want to invite you, sort of that kind of a posture. Um, so you've each selected one habit of the heart that either reflects part of your story or you'd be, you'd want to champion, in particular around the race and culture initiative, the dialogue internally and externally with the community. Could be a champion. I'm not going to have you sign on any doctor line anything. 
So you found one. So what I want to invite each of you to do is to take two to three minutes, each person, to share that habit of the heart with the others at your table. The invitation for the others is to listen well to that habit, their story, and think of one brief, open, and honest question to pose to them based upon what they've said. But briefly, and not everyone has to ask a question, but we'd like at least one question to be posed to each person. And where the stream of consciousness posture comes in, um, you don't have to read. You can, but you don't have to read what you've written down. It's your story. It's your life experience. So just talk about that from the context of how you think, how you feel, and, and what you think. And don't feel attached to what you've written. Often, kind of the early reflection just kind of opens the door for some other reflection. So just be open to that as you share your story with the others. Questions? And try not to take more than a couple of minutes. I know that's going to be, well, that's going to be hard for some of you. Uh, others it'd be easy. But try to, just a couple of minutes, leave a minute for the others to ask you a brief, open, and honest question. Let's begin. Okay. Anybody, uh, any of you try to open and honest questions? Raise your hand if you try to an open and honest question. <laughs> Did you see any opportunity for an open and honest question? Yes. So that's, that's progress. What the invitation is, is to hold the possibility of an open and honest question in all levels of your engagement. Some of that will take some reflection, but at least you have a, something in the toolbox to begin to use as, to enhance engagement with one another. So I want to continue to invite you to, to do that. Um, any overall feedback about a habit of the heart that resonated with you that you'd like to offer? Especially if you see some relevance to either the task force in general or subcommittee in particular in your role. And again, I'm not, we're not signing you up to do that, but I just want to invite your voice around that. Any voices? Charles. I think, I think all of this is really related to the first one. The, we're all in this together. And yes, related to, to our work here as well. Thank you. Others, what other habits were selected? Mine was the number five of Pastor's Great Community. Um, I felt like it was fair. I felt like I was obligated in a way because I feel like I'm representing the Asian um, community. And I sit around and I'm the only Asian here. So I feel like I have to have a voice um, for us. Thank you. <laughs> Others. What other habits were in the room? I'll take that as a sign of hunger. <laughs> we have lunch across the hall. Let me invite a little emphasis on one of the habits and the way that I did with the touchstones that is exceptionally applicable to our work. All of them are applicable, but I want to invite your consideration particularly around number three, an ability to hold tension in life-giving ways. So many of these conversations around race and culture and diversity and inclusion and equity, uh, it's going to be tension, right? How many have had tension-free conversations about race and culture and differences? Um, and it's a lot of ways to hold tension, right? As, as adults, we've held tension well, at times and other times, we you know we went to hell in a handbasket. Um, so to be able to hold tension in a way that's life-giving for me is at the core of what the possibilities of race and culture task force and our engagement with our broader community and stakeholders is all about. We're not going to get rid of tension. Tension has come to being human, but because it's tension, doesn't mean that 
that everything breaks apart. There are life-giving ways to hold tension without compromising our diverse perspectives, and yet to advance, to craft, to frame a actionable recommendation. So when I think about holding tension, how many are familiar with paradox? Another way of saying holding tension. And I know there's a lot of uh, polarity management textbooks from way back and some that are more modern. I know that paradox and this way of tension holding is critical to all the conversation models that we have, courageous conversations and, and several other dialogue models. Uh, it doesn't do away with the tension. It's how you hold it. So this is how I think of it. And we've got just a brief handout for, you, for, for your reference for later. Um, so when I think of holding paradox or holding tension, it's about choosing both and thinking instead of either or thinking. Both and rather than either or. It's not about something being right or wrong. If you can imagine, some things can be right and wrong. That, that really throws you for a loop. But paradox works like that in our personal as well as our professional lives. Uh, and I would say that most of the troubles, personal and political, are caused by either or thinking. When I think of uh, engaging in conversation, uh, a person who has a political or religious belief different from my own, either or thinking creates a combative situation. They're wrong, or rather, I'm right, so they have to be wrong. And there's no productive dialogue. Good recommendation is not going to come from if the way, the way we line up is anybody different from us is wrong. But both and thinking creates a completely different container. If I can imagine, and again, this is exactly the metaphor of the six blind men and the elephant. To be able to hold the tension productively using both and thinking, then says that I don't have everything right. And if I don't have everything right, maybe they don't have everything wrong. Maybe both of us have parts of the truth. And that creates a completely different engagement. And one last little caveat on, on holding tension and holding paradox. A lot of this is about hospitality. As leaders creating spaces where diverse perspectives and voices and identities can feel not only safe, you know, Nobody wants to be disrespected and dismissed or discounted. But how many of you rush to places that they're not going to disrespect you and that's, 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 that's the goal right there, just not going to disrespect you. That's not inviting. You want a space that not only will respect you, but that will invite your, your ideas, that will engage what you find important, will welcome your ideas. So here's, a, for me, the, one of the the real key components of holding tensions well, holding paradox, is that if we don't have the courage to hold tensions in our own personal lives, because we each are walking uh, boxes of paradox, there are things that are happening in our lives that we hold in ways that are both and. So how do we extend, and that's being hospitable to ourselves, how do we extend that same quality of hospitality to others whose ideas and identities are different from our own? As leaders, how do we model that so that communities of all colors and all identities see a light, if you would, and not that we're the first. It's happening. The good thing is actually happening in our neighborhoods. It's happening in different organizations and congregations. So you're not inventing it. But we have to be able to embody that. Because that says to a diversity of community, well beyond our abilities to, to line up with just the right ones, we're not going to be able to do that. But we can create spaces where people feel valued, feel their voices are welcome. And holding paradox, holding these tensions in life-giving ways is how we do that. So this language that you've experienced just in the last 52 minutes and 12 seconds, Part of what I want to invite us to help infuse our recommendations, 
This is the, um, the pre-work. It doesn't name the strategies, but it does create a certain environment of how we're engaging one another and then how we seek to engage the other stakeholders. Uh, I'm going to give you some other language just briefly right after lunch um, and then spend time in the subcommittees, uh, hear from those different groups, see what we've missed in this, this short, long day, uh, and then be out of here before 3 o'clock. Any closing questions? Uh, I believe lunch is ready and served across the hall. You have a video PowerPoint presentation and three handouts to review as you eat. Um, you don't. <laughs> it's unstructured. We invite good conversation. We're going to start so we get out even earlier. Um, plus, after lunch, I know what happens after lunch. So. All right, um, and I can't tell at glance how many from each of the subcommittees are present. But the, um, the plan was to spend some of the time uh, for the subcommittees to kind of check in and around several ways. One, I would suggest, given today particularly the questions and the recommendations that you started with them this morning, how some of those impact particular subcommittees. Some of that was informed by the subcommittees, I can appreciate. But to make sure that all of them get a chance to kind of look at that, and it may help if you look at the flip pads as well, in addition to your notes. So that's one. Kind of check in around the, the difficult uh, issues and questions and the recommendations from the lens of, the, of your subcommittee. Um, I want to invite um, Bob Red Rosa, as, as they desire, along with Fernando, regarding kind of the, the framework that was offered up early around the subcommittees to have your focus. And you've named some of that this morning, uh, particularly around guidance toward recommendation, is to be uh, clarity around the disparities. Where are the disparities? One sense, where the, the data clearly points to some disparity, that's one of the, the key areas to frame recommendations around. I think the other side of that would be if where data is not, what's the term, disaggregated, so that you can't identify disparities. That's another lens to look at what's appropriate uh, to recommend in, in service of addressing disparities. That's one of the ways that's been named to keep the, the, the the focus from being too broad uh, and to keep it where it can be actionable, where we've got data to support. So uh, any, anything else around subcommittees uh, that either co-chairs or Fernando, Fernando would like to offer? That? I think as Fernando said earlier, is that we make sure that we set those recommendations that they're realistic, realistic recommendations because we want to be able to, to implement and attain and achieve uh, some of those uh, recommendations to make it sure that we can close the gap on some of the disparity that's going on in the city. Uh, we know it's there. We're not going to take care of all of the issues, but we need to try to uh, address as many of them as we can. So let's be realistic.
together as opposed to doing that only at the subcommittees. Anything else that you would find helpful? A question that you're carrying, uh, a suggestion, an idea, anything else related to, again, the, the difficult issues, the tensions, uh, and the recommendations emerging? Anything around that? Yes, Terry. Is it, whether it's this meeting or one in the future, a lot of these have interconnected issues. Is there going to be an opportunity for us to be able to maybe brainstorm some of this interconnectedness so that we're understanding that they might, since it's hitting six or five or all, would that become part of the priority process in regard to recommendations? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, what we might want to do is let the co-chairs, uh, and we're, we're meeting next Monday, and let's talk, let us talk through that process that we can bring to our next task force meeting. Right. So because there is a lot of interconnectivity, and it could be that we have the, the city staff that comes to the clearinghouse to get us the answers from each committee or something, but let us think that through. Right. Yeah. I think that's appropriate and excellent. And one way to think about it also is that it's not a subcommittee that's rec submitting recommendations. It's the full task force recommendations. So what emerges from each subcommittee, yes, it'll be looking at the interconnectivity, not only for, for maybe kind of weak areas, but for, for strength. There may be powerful uh, logic in aligning multiple subcommittees into one very strong, actionable recommendation. Uh, so that's that's a powerful, powerful question. What else? I just have a couple of things. Yes. Um, oh, I'm people? sorry. Yeah, we have a co-chair sitting out here. Oh, too. that's okay. I'm Lily. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just thinking about the question you raised, I think as we pull all the recommendations together, the committees need to uh, consider priority. And I go back to what Mr. Dansby said a minute ago. You know, maybe phase one, phase two, maybe just one big recommendation from a committee. But the implementation piece comes in three or four phases. It has to be, should be, a reflection of what the community needs are. And that's why so many people are coming forward, and that's why we're inviting people to come forward to a part of the, of the discussion. The other thing, too, is the sustainability of it and, and getting to the point of the monitoring, what kind of reports do we want to see back as a result of its implementation because otherwise it will go nowhere if you don't hold somebody accountable. So once the recommendations are accepted, then what is the city's plan to, um, to monitor the sustainability and the outcomes? And be thinking a little bit about if you go into multi-phase implementation, uh, be thinking about what percent of the implementation or what aspects of the implementation do you want to see come forward first, second, third, what's most important? But um, it's, I think, it, I think it's a, a lot to think about. Uh, I don't think that we need to take anything off the table. And I agree with what was said earlier, we shouldn't come forward with 50 or 60 areas because <coughs> that really distracts from everything we're trying to accomplish. But maybe a couple of things from each subcommittee that can be aggregated in some way that makes sense. Excellent. Excellent. I actually hear emerging from various perspectives, kind of a matrix. We get a laundry list of recommendations, and we have a matrix of criteria owned by the full task force, and that coming out of that, we're looking at maybe eight to 10 highly actionable recommendation with, with sufficient ownership from, from each of you. What else? Anything else you want to say or ask? So, we have a portion of the agenda, a uh, couple of portions, I just want to name, and we've got the handouts, but I want to invite you to take that for, uh, for reading and review later, uh, but I want to name them, because they're in service of the agenda items around normalizing and operationalizing uh, racial equity, racial and cultural equity, um, in ways that, so we passed out a a two-page uh, common definition, shared language, um, and I revised it. Now it's three pages. 
It, it could have been 12, just to give you an appreciation of what I was trying to do. Now let me give you just some, I, I named on here, that I took two of the national uh, initiatives that have been working, uh, actually one big national one and one with a kind of a local expression. Uh, they were pretty, I think, pretty, pretty good and consistent uh, uh, glossary of terms that have been used in a lot of settings. So that's what I started with. And then what I was doing was gleaning concepts, ideas, and language from your task force meetings, words and concepts that you offered up. I brought those in to help me kind of glean down these that you find, uh, along with some that are more boilerplate with racial equity, racial and cultural equity planning. Um, so that's what you have. It's not intended to be exhaustive. It doesn't name everything, but it names uh, a great number of provocative concepts and ideas to give us, again, some shared understanding. This is not a, a litmus test. This is not to say you sign off on agreeing with every definition of every concept and idea. It's not like that. But whether you agree or not, some appreciation and understanding for this language is going to uh, serve us well in crafting not only the uh, some racial cultural equity plan, but in looking at the recommendations. These are pretty established, uh, mostly pretty established. A few of them that's, I don't know if the established would be a word that you could put with it. They're still a little bit on the edge, but insightful and provocative. And I don't know that you can pick up a newspaper without finding some of these uh, related. So. Uh, rather than have you go through them now, just want to invite you to familiarize yourself with these concepts. Uh, where there's an edge, that's an opportunity for discussion within your subcommittee and the larger task force. If you think a concept is not useful or not helpful, and the opposite is true. Some of this language is powerful language, but you have to own it. If you don't own it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yes, well, I, I just want to say, I think this is wonderful uh, and for us to understand the, the language. My question is this, and looking at this is from Portland. If we're going to be really looking at disparity within the city of Fort Worth, where's the cities? Where's our cities? Right, so we have disparity reports for, for our city. That's going to be the data points that you okay, look at. So, so you'll, you'll do, we'll do some kind of comparison there. Right, and actually, that's where the the recommendations and these concepts are going to be framed around our data. So that's a strong point. I just use these, the, that city, and I've, I've got three others as a resource of best practices. It won't be identical, just gives you a frame of reference. And that's Portland, New Orleans, Louisville, and Seattle. And three of them I've actually, I've been to, I've, I've been, I've had some level of involvement that I can at least uh, speak to. Yes, Kate. So it sounds to me like one of the things, services you may do is provide the city of Fort Worth with a glossary? Yeah, so we've named a resource. Yeah, we've named a resource guide for the city. So everything that we're gleaning, every, the best practices, processes, will be kind of a resource guide for in service of the city's racial and cultural equity. That's excellent. One last question. So, yes. just to be clear from Mr. Dancy's question, you said the city of Fort Worth does not Yeah. Human Relations Commission. Right. The commission has some of these services that, that their importance mm -hmm. offers. You just don't call it this, but That's we right. have human relations. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. responsibilities. Right. Yeah. But I thought to Mr. Dansby's question, weren't we asking about the employees of the city of Fort Worth? Like the EO office within HR? Isn't that more what we were asking? What are their from an employment standpoint? It's, now as far as the disparity assessment, that includes all of the it's not just that area for, for the disparity data that we're going to be that we're going to be referencing. Okay. It includes all the departments. Okay. And I think this came up this morning that in, in a sense we've got an entity within the city of Fort Worth, but how it's used and how it's re reinforced in a way to make it more 
more resourceful or more powerful, that would be a question because I would say that uh, Portland's Office of Equity and Human Rights, yeah, they've got some particular teeth in theirs that our HRC doesn't have. But that's the makings of, of a recommendation. Does our HR, does our human rights commission still have subpoena power? You know, one time it did, where is it going? Yeah, it, it's significantly changed. So I don't know. I, I don't, yeah, I don't. Does our human rights commission, does it have subpoena power still? I'm not sure. That might be better answered by the AG. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I mean, one time it did, but I, I thought at some point they get there and wait for It's been significantly downsized in the last, yeah, since, since, uh, since I was here. That may be just something that we want to bring in the structure of the Human Relations Commission and talk about that so that everybody knows what, it, what, what, why it was started. Because it just celebrated, what, the 25th year? So that we were talking about the past of the HRC and the current. If you'd like, we can invite uh, Chris Trout, who's the lawyer uh, for the Human Relations Commission, to come and, and brief us about the, the powers and duties of the Human Relations Commission. And you can decide whether you want to make recommendations to strengthen. But it sounds like we need to know what is in that space Matt. versus right. what is in the city's HR right, department space and what doesn't exist at all is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, the city's HR is fairly conventional. I mean, it doesn't include the elements of the HRC. But well, yeah, you, that kind you've of already thing. met uh, uh, Brian Dickerson. He gave a talk. About the city government uh, workforce. And he gave his uh, his information to share with us right early on. So disparities in that category is one of the areas that recommendations can be formed from. I mean, we look in the other departments and see where do we have sufficient disaggregation that we can determine disparities. And if we can, that's a question. And a recommendation, and when we can, that should lead us to some uh, recommendations. Of and the cities that you work with, that you reference, Marlins, and I believe and the, uh, I think Seattle was the other one, did they all have the office that's part of their city of equity and human rights? Not exactly those same names, but they all have a, a fairly high level, uh, department level entity that's responsible and accountable for the, uh, the equity plan. So all of those have the similarities. Uh -huh. other, other questions? Is that something we need to capture? I hear uh, just, uh, just a point of clarification for, for me and not anybody else, but the, the commission itself is appointed by city council members. By, no, no, by the, by the mayor. Uh, subject to approval mm -hmm. by the full city council. It is okay. not right. appointed they, by the city council. But they are appointed. They are appointed by the This, by the, this yeah. group we're talking about here, they're actually staff. They're yeah. staff, yes. So does Fort Worth have a staff? Well, Angie Rush and her staff support the commission. That is the staff, yes. Right. Okay. Okay. They should they should they enforce they our civil rights law. Okay. All right, Fort Worth had the Department of Equity and Advocacy. And even during that time, and it serves the same purpose as this committee as in, in Portland for the school district. The city, they, they work with the commission, but there's no department that's set up that actually looks at everything, oversees everything for the city. And as far as employment, opportunities, all, you know, everything that goes with human resources when it comes to equity and practice. There's nobody there. We have, we have a human resources department that does work internally, and then we have the human relations commission that deals with community wide. Let me be more specific. Whenever there was a job opening for work, these folks had to be a part of the panel. They did not vote on anything, but they oversaw the process to make sure it was fair and equitable for everybody. That's our human resources and department. And so that's the same way when we looked at contracts and everything else. And so you now that's the human resources department. Yes, anything about employment within the city of Fort Worth, yes. And they and they are responsible for ensuring that the process the process is open and inclusive. So the question the answer is no. Fort Worth does not have an 
Office of Equity and Human Rights. Okay. Not by that name. Not by that name. Not by that name. But they have an HR department that oversees the HRC. They have a, we have a human relations. We have a human resources department that deals with all hiring procedures uh, and, and uh, equity on the job. And we have a human uh, relations commission that deals with uh, civil rights across the community. So there are a number of ordinances, right, like the HRC. Yes, and whereas Letitia Brown just came here from a lot of parts. Right. So I told her I was going to ask her to answer the question. <laughs> so the staffing you're going to see, employment, fair housing, public accommodations. There are investigations that happen in those areas and they're staffing supporting those areas. So that part we have. Uh, I think what I hear you saying, Brother Dan, is that around accountability, is there a high level cross-cutting accountability? That's, that, that's, that's just the so Tisha is here to answer all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So I think one of the questions was about the subpoena power of the Human Relations Commission. Chris Trout, one of our attorneys, is uh, the advisor, and he's double-checking this uh, for us. But um, his understanding is they have they have limited subpoena power under um, housing issues, but it does not go for places of uh, public accommodation issues. Thank you. I'm here for the rest of the meeting if you need. Me. Thank you. So what I'm hearing from several vantage points is that it would be important and informative to be clear about the particular functions and at what level of functions our Human Relations uh, Commission has compared to other best practices and where their, what their functions are and at what level they are. And if ours is departmentalized and not cross-cutting, then that's a different level of accountability and responsibility. So we can look at that specifically. Thank you. What else? Anything else? OK. Uh, so is there any, anything that jumps out at you, anything that's real uh, important to name from that, those three simple pages of, of concepts and definition that you have? Uh, again, I can think of at least a half a dozen of you that offered up some of these concepts as potential training uh, or an orientation. Just want to invite if, if there's any that really that you deem are very important for us to, to look at. And if you see any on that, that that you think it has no value at all. My fragility and my privilege. If we don't talk about that, you know, we've got to help people understand that. And we have to help people understand what systemic racism is. That you can not call someone the N-word or be terrible to them and still benefit from racist structure and systemic racism. So those are two of the ones that I heard uh, consistently from the task force, and that's why they're on here along with, um, again, kind of opening up racism at the individual, institutional, and structural level to bring some distinctions between that. We heard that also from our community conversations and that they were kind of collapsed and there wasn't a lot of distinction. So this gives us clarity about what we're talking about. And, and as we move toward framing recommendations, what are the recommendations pointing toward? Any, any other questions, uh, just high level things you want to flag about these that you're going to um, read, review, and memorize, and be tested on in the next task. <laughs> All right. So we look at the practices that we went through with the touchstones and the habits that inform us how we might want to consider engaging not only one another, but different stakeholders. We started with particular difficult issues and questions and recommend potential recommendations. And then we've got some additional language. Uh, I also wanted to say if there's another concept or idea, a definition that you think would be helpful, uh, to, to, to email us and we can add it and, 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 and go from there. So what I want to invite you now to do is to get into the your subcommittees. Um, I, I want to just almost tongue in cheek say you know who you are. Um, you, you do know who you are. All right? <laughs> And I'll see you one here. Yeah, here's, I can't remember. If you got more than one, uh, I'm going to assume 
you're equally committed to all the ones that you signed up for. So I want to invite you to go where there are the fewest people. So if one of your committees has six people already here, I would suggest that you consider going to one with fewer numbers. Uh, so um, with, with the subcommittee chairs kind of rally their troops at their table. Economic development. So um, let's move toward a wrap and get a kind of a brief report out. And I, I do want to name one thing I want to test uh, with the particular with the different subcommittees. I know that y'all have been in a, that feedback, but just for you to be thinking about, as you schedule your individual subcommittee meetings, one thing that I was noticing is kind of the, you call some intersectionality in the actual recommendation. Well, there's some energy around the intersectionality of members. So what might be the uh, benefit of one of your future meetings, particularly as we get close to framing recommendations, having a one date that all the subcommittees are meeting, you break out, but you also come back together and summarizing. That may facilitate the kind of intersectionality uh, and, and, and framing of the recommendations that you've made. And also, when y'all have your resources in front of y'all, if you know that this is something that's really near and dear to the health organization and health developers, uh, for, for many, I'm sorry, invite them to your meeting to hear from that resource. So that way you're all hearing it from, you know, from them. So let's kind of go around the room, as we did before, invite kind of a report out, first from that group, you know, whoever wants to lead off, and then any of the others to support, and then open it up to the whole room. Any questions? Uh, Y'all want to start with the PowerPoint presentation? That uh, <laughs> is that education? Yes. Well, they just had the benefit of having a support person here. That's <laughs> good benefit. Okay. So uh, discussion here was to continue talking about uh, the disparities that the committee identified and then possibly some of the, the recommendations that are easy, um, I guess low hanging for easy touch points. So the disparity with um, literacy is one that we've been talking about with K-12, so literacy and talking about how our libraries, city libraries can support that uh, out of time, uh, out of school time. So, after school in the summertime, how can our libraries and our community centers, what recommendations can we make to the city to support that? Recommendations like um, uh, culturally relevant content in our library, making sure black and, black and brown children see themselves relevant in the literature. Uh, and if that's, that literature is not there, why is it not there? How do we get it? What are some things that our library system can do to make sure that that uh, uh, it's something that's included in the neighborhood where it's needed. That's one of the things, uh, universal pre-k, same thing. How can we support that with our community centers, with, with out of school, what, uh, how can we mobilize all of the different community groups? So again, with the literacy and disparity in pre-k, how can we mobilize some of these groups that are around us? So many of the city could really be the one to bring everybody together and I'll be in the same conversation. So that's more of the city, our, us saying the city could be more aware, helping with awareness. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and we were also talking about the, our other disparity is college and career readiness. That's one we're focused on. So how can the city use our partners, like the TCC, uh, to talk about career? We know what economic development is going on. We know what companies are trying to come to the city, what industries are booming, what are not. We have all that information and data, so can we use that to mobilize our Fort Worth ISD, partnership with PCC, or whoever else in the city uh, needs to be partnered with to move that forward so we have a better track of the college and career readiness for students. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, fellow leaders, any, any comments? Yeah. Further? She covered it well. We have a lot of work to do. So we're, we're starting to narrow down our paths, but I think it's helping. Excellent. Excellent. Larger group, any questions or comments? Just help. We talked about health education as well. 
piece uh, really deals with that because we have, uh, and I, I don't want to blame it on anything in particular, but uh, we, had a, we had a big cultural shock back then with Katrina. And the systems that some kids came from versus the systems of Texas were very much different in its disciplines, the way things were handled, and its coursework and everything else. Uh, they're here now, and they're here as parents. And so I think we need to do something, or at least uh, put emphasis on adult education. Excellent. Any others? Have you guys reached out to the organizations like in Fort Worth or the after school programs? Is that on your list? They'll be presenting yes. uh, to us as subject matter experts. Okay. Excellent. Next. There's a next door app that's being utilized that is done by neighborhoods, so maybe have a more robust program, adding more to that since it's already there for something different than needed, a different type of app that can be uh, localized to your community so that you're not getting all this information, but um, a health fair comes along that you know about it. Um, the other thing, an electronic version of a Parks and Rec book, they came and spoke to us, a great um, book that highlights all the community centers in, the, in Fort Worth, but they have very limited resources to put that and get that out. And so maybe having one that is just, again, for your neighborhood, what's in your in your area, and it's more economically feasible. Um, we talked about community health workers and, and getting them um, to increase. Uh, they're kind of the boots in the ground, and they're a great way to get information out, especially about health but really increasing the numbers that's out there and informing them with the right information. So a lot of them are siloed in different areas, but I know they have an alliance and network, but really being a little bit more robust and strategic with that alliance. And then also the information that does go out, uh, having a, a health literacy that is um, more, more able for people to reach and, and understand, so more of that lower level that's maybe more pictorial in certain areas for Hispanics and things like that. Um, the other barrier that we talked about a lot of people as well in the other groups is transportation. So cross-referencing it with the T committee of what's out there, their eligibility requirements for some of those programs, like uh, Yolanda had said earlier, um, is, is not to work and not to be used to go to the doctor. So that's some of those issues that kind of prohibit us from uh, getting healthier, and then also not only the T but CAP services. So, some of our community health workers say that yes, there's a voucher, you get a voucher, but it's very limited. If you have to bring your family along with you, then that CAP service is now $100. So, the vouchers are go very limited. So, instead of being able to hand out 10, they're only able to hand out one because of the cost. So, looking at partnering with those agencies to lower income discounts. Uh, we talked about there's a lot of uh, initiatives that help uh, had went out to the food carts being healthy food carts. Uh, discounts were given and fees and all of that, but a lot of people don't, still don't know that that's an option for them to gain a business and also provide healthier options in their communities. Uh, JPS Connection is, is a great program, but I think it's very hard to utilize, very hard to access, so maybe um, reviewing some of their intake process and reviewing those forms is there a way to make it easier, maybe lessen the requirements. And then also um, having more intake counselors or you know, just more in number and also more in the community, going instead of having them to have to come to JPS to drop that off, having them in those community centers so that they're going to the community. Uh, and now that we talked about community centers, also having more in health and wellness centers at those, they have different fun programs, but nothing that when we looked at the programming that said about diabetes, nothing that said about high blood pressure, nothing that said how do you go to the doctor, how do you, what questions to ask when you get there. Um, and then waiving fees, having a day for a week, then you can waive fees for enrollment, because it's still for a family of four or five, it's still very costly, and then they can't access and utilize that. Um, and then having an inventory of offerings, 
and looking at it being equitable. Some community centers have a full gym, and some of them have one little treadmill in the corner. So looking at the, uh, the resources that are each, at each of them. And then uh, maybe even having a blood pressure kiosk at each of the community centers uh, as a way for you to kind of check for health and then have resources that go along with that. And then the other thing we talked about uh, in our committee, infant mortality has been around for 20 years and it's still, after 20 years, it seems to have to be infected. So we're looking at, you know, there's lots of initiatives. Is the core moving? If not, why? Excellent. Uh, table co leaders, anything you want to add? No. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Larger group, any questions or comments on, on the health? You know, what was about the advocacy? What was that part about? Was that, that part was about, remember when the, we were at the meeting and um, when the, um, the, com the community health workers with the advocacy is what she talked about, the example that she gave was, say for instance, you are eligible to have a resource, or you are, you are, you can go to a doctor, you have that taken care of, but just having an advocate to go on your behalf for the voucher. So the example that she, uh, she gave was, say for instance, there's a young mother, she was, she was married, her husband, they did not have a vehicle, the mother, uh, the husband went to work by public transportation, but she had two babies who were under uh, school age, but she just had twins. So for her to get a voucher to take a cab, that cab was still going to cost her about $100 because now the cab service is charging every individual that's in the cab. So if you don't have someone who's advocating for you just for that one doctor's visit, then what you end up doing is canceling your visit. So having an advocate is very important, uh, and we need more. But then it goes back to kind of what Sharon Wilson was talking about last week with those court advocates. You know, they have to have a degree in psychology or whatever, and it's like, can we remove some of these requirements so those people who are eligible or can do these jobs can get in there and assist and help? Excellent. Excellent. Any others? A larger group? Well, I, yes, well, the question I have is on this uh, 20 or whatever they charge with the cab charges per passenger, isn't that something that can be addressed? That's like an explorative. Yes, that, that, that's here, the voucher cost availability, you know, we don't know, I guess we could, I don't know the, the cab service and what their requirements are, but I think every time we get in a cab, they do charge for, you know, additional for the number of people, I don't know. How about distance, wasn't it, for, because wherever it's you're getting picked up to wherever you're going and then you go back, it's a round trip, so even though you get a $25 voucher, it might not even cover that whole round trip, is what it is. But your question is, could we incorporate a recommendation to address those fees that the caps charge? Yes. Okay. Like this per person charge, that is so ludicrous. It's almost as if they're taking advantage of a government program. Right. Yeah. They do with everybody, I think. It's not yeah, specific it's, to the vouchers. It's, it's changed now to where it's like you get in and it's mileage, but at the same time, if you have three or four people, they charge you a surcharge per head. Mm -hmm. yes. so it's not specific to the vouchers, just the way they run their business. Yes. Sounds like an invitation for Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Who Does that regulates make sense? that? Yes. Yeah, there is regulation for that. That's that's so that would be a, a question. And, and part with the disparities, the data would come in on where the are those are vouchers paid by the organization. The organization. Different organization. Oh, organization yeah. for, but they only have so much too. They might only have a hundred. But then, out of the hundred, you have thousands, and then who do you give the hundreds to? Because I asked the question of how, which, who do you give which doctor to who? Do you have to be sick, or you know, what does that level look like? And those with the advocates are more likely to get the vouchers than those without. So that's a that's going to be a probably a very powerful uh, intersectionality piece because the way fees are generated from a very host of services across all these subcommittees is going to be similar. So that's yeah. next. It's only two of you left, so. We had housing and criminal justice, so we decided to kind of co-mingle and see some of the problems that we had as a whole. So for housing, some of the issues were obviously, like we were talking about the vouchers, 
And so we said, how does criminal justice affect the housing or the vouchers that are given out? What we noticed was people are gravitating to certain areas, and that obviously leads to a high crime area just because of the, the people who are living there. And so one of the suggestions was called ban the box. I think that it was brought up that they are exercising this in other cities. So rather than on a home application, someone asking, are you a felon or a convicted felon, they take the box out completely and you're no longer allowed to ask that. Um, and then for housing and employment. For housing and employment, correct. And then one of the other issues was, it goes right back into that landlords who are preying on affordable housing vouchers, meaning they're not necessarily calling in the police when something happens, they want to keep receiving their money and just kind of taking advantage of the people who need it. So that, that creates a Las Vegas trail kind of area. Is that? Okay. Yeah, I'm not on the housing committee, so I'm just. But I am on the criminal justice committee. And some of the things that we've been working on there, uh, we've had a lot of different speakers come in. Um, some of the things we've noticed so far disparities of FTO. So the field training officers that we have, how many were there, Mr. Danby? 300? Yeah, 300 plus. There's, there, are, there are right around 330, I think. And out of 330, 18 of the field, field training officers are African American and 30, where is that? No, I think 23, somewhere in 23. So the disparities vary greatly, and so what, what that causes is um, we are no longer having a diverse group of, like, FTOs are not training the trainees in a diverse situation. So we've got two white officers training in East Fort Worth, and we're not seeing any kind of positive movement on that. So we suggested that the FTOs need to be trained. Oh, on top of that, we, um, we're noticing that they need to be trained and execute uniformly. So we talked to some of the FTOs that came to one of our uh, meetings, and what they said was each officer is trained when they first come in, but not every officer executes the way they were trained, meaning I'm an FTO, and I have a rookie, and I perform a routine stop. I may perform my routine stop different than you will perform yours, and that's how I train, that's how I train my trainee. Therefore, we don't have any uniformity across how our rookies are being trained. So people are just kind of going out and doing whatever they feel, see fit in whatever the situation is. Um, also, so to caveat off of that, trainees need to be trained with different races. Uh, we asked if we had any kind of um, mix with white officers, black officers, white officers, Hispanic officers, and they said that's not necessarily happening. They're putting white officers with white officers across the, the city. Uh, and one other major thing we noticed was they said that cultural training, the way they conduct their cultural training is they'll select an officer, they'll send them off to get trained, and he will come back, he or she will come back and train their unit or their force. Uh, we're suggesting that we bring someone from the outside in to train our force. Cultural training. Did I miss anything? You have a lot of notes. No, I, I, you covered it. Yeah. I, I just, I have one question. How sure. do they, how do they uh, monitor? the classroom training and how they're trained in versus how they perform in the field? Field training officers, that's what, it. What, what, they, what they said to us, and we, we met with some of the higher ranking officers, and what was, what was said there is that they have a standard training, but that's not to say that when they go out in the field that they actually execute in the same way, right. because they take their personal experiences from the training uh, or for their field experiences, and that's how they teach the other officer. And that also may not be getting the proper training, may not be getting the proper training that's, that's standard for the department. Yeah, and I understand that. So how do they monitor that? How do they, how do they know, say for instance, we get this situation that the drove ball is stopped. That, so how, how did that get measured? Uh, when well, you take apart how they interacted with the, with the community, yeah, how do we, they measure we, that? We asked for a, that they have a, a formal method, methodology for actually uh, evaluating officers. Right. And they did say they're doing some things now where they, they'll come up and they look at incidents and they'll evaluate the incident. Now, the way, the, to your question, the way they find out certain things is how that happened within the context of an arrest or a stop that, that may come up that's, that's questionable. And then that's when they really know whether they, they call a procedure or not. Right. Kind of not, it doesn't really come up unless someone makes a complaint. It's kind of what I gathered from our yeah. meeting. Yeah. I'm going to interject just a little bit here, because after the, um, maybe around the time of fun, but certainly afterwards, um, 
there has been a push to get supervisors to routinely audit um, body cam so that they are monitoring the body cam, which I, there was honestly a push from um, the union when we first went to body cams um, not to do that. And so um, now they, supervisors are required on a, on a quarterly basis to randomly audit body cams. Now does that mean you're going to find something? But yeah, we do. We, I advise the police department, they really depend on citizens to tell them when something goes wrong, but this audit process should be helping them a little bit. That, that was just what I was going to bring up. I mean, this technology is something that wasn't, you know, used uh, 10 years ago. But the fact that we have it uh, ought to be used as a training tool both ways. This is how they did it wrong. This is how they did it right. And, and you know, you can learn from that. Hold each other. Someone did suggest the citizens council as well, like it's like as opposed to the like the chiefs council. How do those people get selected? But how how about we create some sort of citizens council who comes in, right? Citizens review board to come in. It got a little controversial, that's, that's but I know of, that was thrown out. That's one of the main things on this that's been talked about, and how that happens, and how they can happen legally. So I know there's something there that was buried there, chapter 143 or something like that, that you that may be a problematic. But I know they're working with you on that. Uh, the other thing, when you talk about the new technology, the new technology now also, when an officer leaves a vehicle, it automatically comes on. Mm -hmm. Before they had to turn it on, that it automatically comes on. So that's something new here in the last year. Right. And so. How about internal affairs? Did we get any information on internal affairs? What what complaints come in and how those look? I think they spoke on it vaguely. Like I don't remember what the question was, what was that was asked. Internal affairs. Uh huh. What did they What did they say about internal? Did we? I know we spoke on it, but I can't remember exactly everything that was said. So here's what happens with the internal affairs: you call the number, and it takes them two days to get back with you. Well, it was discussed. I don't have my notes here. And yeah, I don't have so, my so stuff. They're going to work their way up to it. Um, I talked to. I just happened to run into Ty uh, uh, at Friday evening, and he basically explained what his process is. He's, they're working their way up to that. So they're starting off with uh, what happens, how do we train them at the start, and then they're going to work their way up to the disciplinary part. Um, but it helps to know if that's taking yeah, right. place. If, if the citizens are being asked to call and report, who do they report to, and how is that report handled? What is their process? Because if you call and nobody calls you back for two days, that's, that's apathy, or it, it renders you irrelevant to that conversation. Yeah, Ty's been having some really good speakers, a whole panel, more than task force members there, so it's been pretty good. We were invited to take part in the de-escalation training. Did, how many people in this room went to do that? I did. Uh, I don't know. I went to Ty went to Yeah, I went on the morning. It was, it was done by an outside group out of Washington. Do you remember the name of that group? Anyway, they used, as part of the training, footage from dash cams and body cams. None of it was from Fort Worth, but uh, they did use that training. And this was an outside uh, group. And now this was a four hour segment. It was a short one. Um, and it was, I thought, pretty well done. Um, and, and the fact that that they did bring in an outside group to do this de-escalation training, I thought was a good idea. And it sounds like we could build on that and say, good on you, you did it for this. Why can't you do it for, for the I, cultural training as well? I, I agree, and I think there needs to be uh, some where they actually really review incidents in Fort Worth as examples to from make Fort Worth. from Fort Worth rather than looking at it from other sites, because that way there's a better understanding of the Yes. Yes, Charles. I have a question about the band box thing. It, mm. My question, I guess, is for the attorney is. <laughs> That's what we asked. Is it something that we can regulate? I'm sorry. For the city, this band the box question, both for employment and for rental. Well, that was what I told them that I thought was a. Con I thought that maybe a legal uh, roadblock, but I don't know that we could. Uh, we have any authority to tell employers, private, and we're basically the main public one. And we can certainly 
police ourselves, right. and I think right. we are doing that. Um, but um, I don't know that we can tell private entities what they can do, um, short of they can't discriminate based on um, uh, protected class, but we're going to look at it. Okay. <clears throat> we also asked about if they could offer incentives. You know, so if that was a barrier that was removed and their incentives for and we asked, I asked about um, a program that I've been seeing on social media, it's a Clean the Slate, where it's a lot of homeless, the city of Fort Worth hiring homeless, but <coughs> Leticia was saying, they thought it was a grant, so it's not directly it's not the city of Fort Worth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a contract right. with the Presbyterian Night Show. Right. So we're trying to, you know, those kind of programs too, how does that all plan? Expunging the expunging academy, or what they had as far as getting records expunged on Monday. The DA. Or the DA when they were talking about last week. Right. That's yeah. Clinics. Connecting that to mm -hmm. focused on economic development or housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to all of that. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to our last one. The other, so Jennifer, you brought up the word incentivize. That's another cross cutting with all these subject matters. You know, what might be the parameters of the city incentivizing the progressive action in support of racial cultural equity plans? Uh, that's something that not only lands in one area, but you can look for ways to incentivize the kind of action you think supports in all of them. Uh, now, the last group. Okay, we'll try to be quick. Economic so development. Economic right. development. So, uh, uh, one of our primary efforts is to build more minority businesses, especially African American, given the disparity study, that's where the biggest need is, or strengthen the existing companies that we have. So, uh, and we had former Chamber of Commerce president helping us at our table. So it was pointed out that the one area that the uh, city could do a lot better at is in better outreach. Um, first of all, in upcoming con contractual opportunities. In other words, if you look at your projects for your bond program, for example, what's coming up the next quarter, the next six months, the next 12 months. So you're not, uh, companies are not caught on short notice where they uh, don't have time to prepare an adequate bid. So that seemed to make a lot of sense. Uh, more explanation of the uh, criteria uh, required to be a city vendor, whether that be certification or bonding requirements or what, whatever. Uh, more education on that, again, uh, outreach. Um, highlighting individuals that are successful. Uh, we, we noticed that uh, Robert Stearns, our resource person, economic development director, said the city is uh, starting a, uh, a mentor-protege program so a more mature uh, uh, minority firm can help uh, mentor uh, a, a more fledgling firm to get them up to speed. Um, that we should have compile a database, basically, uh, of uh, minority businesses by uh, discipline, sort of, so we know what's available uh, locally, so that, yes, yeah, great, in some projects there's high minority subcontracting percentage, but they're not Fort Worth firms, so that's not really what we're trying to target. Um, So workforce was a, a, a big component, unfortunately. We have Judy on the, uh, on the committee with us. Um, but can you speak to advocacy here? We were just talking about, and we, and we ran out of time about this this time, is just working more closely uh, with some of the economic development initiatives uh, being an advocate for career technical education, which is an ongoing, growing uh, issue, I think. Um, seeing how we can work more closely together. Uh, we were talking about that we have an advantage here that uh, in Texas, so many of the employment training 
programs are together. And so I think there's just a lot more we can do, but we're not even having the conversation really with the city most of the time. Excellent. Any others from that table? Comments? A broader group? Any questions or comments that have been developed? And I know the mentor protege uh, is given. It doesn't have to, have to be uh, minority to minority. Okay. It could be any mixture as okay. long as the other company had the, the background and experience to expose to. I think they're looking something like vet construction. Mentoring, uh, you know, the WWE, the bigger companies. So Mentoring, you know, that's going to be that construction, Austin, you know, all of those type of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. No, 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 no. It's, it, and it typically isn't. And it typically isn't minority over minority. I've never seen it. Thanks, I, I didn't, I didn't just like, understand. Okay. Any others? Well, thank you for some great work, contributions of thought uh, and experience, and opening to some different ideas. Before we then turn to closing remarks and adjournment by our co-chairs, I uh, just want to draw attention to the, that last packet includes more details on race and cultural equity plans from uh, the city of New Orleans, uh, Portland, and Louisville. And I also want to say Portland will probably reference it, but a significant amount of their equity plan is based upon Seattle's. So but this is to give you something visual to look at as you begin to frame uh, recommendations and imagine something that would work specifically for Fort Worth. There, you'll see some correlations between findings that they have and some of their ideas. In Louisville, you see that one page that shows priorities and recommendations, real succinct. Uh, so just food for thought. Oh, we'll stack some of those. Uh, we'll, we'll uh, now our closing remarks from our our co-chairs. Lily? Do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, just, just a couple of things I want to just say in closing and I'll be brief. Um, you know, one of the things I want everybody to hear today is that the committees that we selected or the committees that the data drove us to select, uh, you validated that today. And I think it's really important that we stay energized and that we, take, we celebrate the things that we've done well as a, as a group. So validated that. I heard that come through. So now we have to get targeted. We have to get focused on the targets and recommendations that we're going to make. I think that um, <clears throat> the, we need a clearinghouse for information. Uh, so as you work through your committees, that you look at that information and that what doesn't fit you don't spend a whole lot of time with it. Put it on the parking lot, leave it there, and go maybe go back and, and move it later. But don't get bogged down with it because it'll it'll steal your joy. And uh, and and the priority, don't keep that in mind as you have 50 maybe or 25. What what takes priority? And then how do we sustain it? And how do we measure and monitor it? Measuring and monitoring is going to be really important. So as you move into your actionable item kind of process. How do we measure it? How do we monitor it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, thank you all. And I want us to thank our uh, the city staff that's been here with us. And Fernando and everybody. Thank you. Uh, there's still, as, as we're, we're a work in progress. And uh, one of the things I know we need to look at, and I wrote a few things, is you know looking at how we connect with the issues that yeah. we're dealing with, you know, from the six committees and how they intertwine with each other. To, so we'll be looking at creating a process to where we can get information to and from each committee on, um, you know, any of the recommendations that you are looking at or any questions or concerns that come up. Uh, and again, if you know that you've got a speaker that will touch a little bit of everything, especially transportation at your committee, uh, that you're going to have a speaker or a resource come and visit with you, ask some of the other committees that they'd like to attend. So that way, you know, we can hear it all from the same schools there. Uh, we're going to get more information about the HRC Resource uh, Commission. So we'll probably have a presentation at the next month's meeting. Would that be possible? Yeah, I don't know. Awesome. So you just bring up, you know, talking about the minis and all the resources and data, is there a way for our staff support to 
put it all in one place so that if we can't make it to the committees, is there like one drive or uh, place? Can Michelle put that all together on breaking out the information that each of the committees are you know, visiting with so that we we'll keep it up to date maybe on our website or share? Or, you know, I don't know what the rules are on all that, but well, you want the, you, are you talking about the information to share with the public or information just for the just committee? for the committee? Just for the committee. Just, just for the committees. Yeah, I mean, we've we've gotten the stuff that has been presented in our big groups here, I'll but then also the smaller groups, or even if we miss the meeting, and it just we've had a lot of email traffic with this effort, and so just to make sure we don't miss anything. I'll meet with Michelle. Look for something. I'll meet with Michelle and see what we can do. That'd be great. I just had one more thought, but I said, I'm sorry. This group over here created a, map, a model earlier today. I'd like to request that they continue to work on that model because it's a picture of how we all function together. That was my next thing. Great minds. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you saw, I mean, that was a great picture to see how everything just crosses, you know. I'm going to be transcribing all the notes, okay. and I'll get it out to everybody. Thank you. Because that showed really how it all intertwines. I know earlier we had talked about redistricting and people were saying how does redistricting fit in here? Well, it fits all those categories because it's all about representation. So it is important. Uh, one of the other things we talked about is uh, realistic recommendations and uh, looking how we all connect better. So we as co-chairs have some work to do that we'll bring back some information for you all. We also talked about having another session like this in the whole body, but working in committees and working. Right. I think this was immensely productive today to have criminal justice and transportation sitting with housing. I saw Fernando taking notes. <laughs> well, it caused all sorts yeah. of things to well, yeah, it's, it's good to balance things off to make sure right. that we're all, you know, we're dotting that eye and crossing that T. So if we yeah, can do it at one of our regular meetings or something. Yeah. And maybe we put in our redistricting, our, our task force meeting, maybe we put 40 minutes or 30 minutes to the side for be, us to do that on every meeting. I think so that would let be us co chair talk about that day. and look at schedules because, you know, we know your time is valuable. We don't want to keep you on Mondays till here till 9 o'clock either. But we all know that y'all are very committed to this. But we get a lot done when we're all in the same room. That's true. very true. Yeah. Very true. And the phones are off. Fernando, do you have any comments? I think it's been exceedingly productive. I would, uh, I would remind us, in order to, uh, to maximize our credibility, uh, always to focus on race and culture and disparities that are attributable to race and culture. So, as a as a preface to any of the committee reports or to the full task force report, I would say it's important to document uh, in reference to any of the issues that we're discussing, the extent to which we can attribute disparities to race and culture and the causes of those disparities. Uh, in some cases, these disparities are reasonably well documented. In other cases, they are not so well documented. I think if we're gonna have credibility it's, it's vitally important that we demonstrate uh, those disparities using hard data. Uh, and once we can show, look, there's real, uh, there are real disparities, and whether they're attributable to, to discriminatory policies or discriminatory practices, or whatever the case may be, if we can document that, that there are uh, uh, measurable disparities, uh, then that sets the stage for us to have credibility in launching a recommendation. Otherwise, we're just another group that's addressing issues of poverty or whatever uh, inequity we may want to discuss. So I, I think it's, it's and, I, and I know we didn't have the opportunity in this setting to talk about a lot of the statistical data underlying the disparity, but that's the hard work that the committees are doing with support from, from city staff. And I think that will give us the, the basis for launching uh, recommendations that the city council uh, will be able to implement. It's going to take a lot more than that. It's going to take a lot of influence on your part to get the council to support these recommendations. But at least we'll get in the door, I think, if we can document uh, the, the, the true disparities that, that exist in our community with respect to race and culture. Yes? I know we had requested a, a weekly, not a weekly, but a committee report 
format that we all that was consistent. Yes, you've been providing us with those reports. We have that. So my next question is, will we have some type of outline or draft for us to start listing our recommendations? Because we want to make sure we're covering the, not just the causes. We just don't want to put the recommendations on there. We want to cover, like you just said, right. the causes, the, the, the SMEs we use for that. So right. there's some things that we want to make sure that across the board we're being consistent. So sure. we are making the recommendations instead of just a simple recommendation. Right. No, so will we have a template? We'll be glad to help you with that. Good question. Any other questions? Keep looking, I keep thinking you're going to answer. Is there anything we need to do in regard to forming questions, or is that going to be more before our meetings? Before your meetings, what we'll do is uh, get some information about the uh, HRC to you all prior to the meeting. So this way you can form your questions, bring them in uh, to either Angie or Fernando, whoever okay. the designated person is. And then that way we can also make sure that those questions will be answered at the meeting. I think, I think Letitia has uh, agreed to provide us with a briefing at our March 19th meeting mm -hmm. about the powers and duties of the Human Relations Commission. And if we can send out and some basic information in advance that you can begin to formulate your questions. Right, exactly. And, and we've got, we're blessed to have Estras and Arturo and, and, uh, and Rosa and many others who have served on the Human Relations Commission. Your first hand accounts are, I think, equally important uh, for the task force to understand the, the value of this group. When, when these issues first came up uh, a year ago, I told the city manager, I told the mayor, the group that ought to be dealing with these issues is the Human Relations Commission. That is a group that is, that is legally empowered to address these issues about uh, discrimination and uh, disparate treatment. And yet I knew, as, 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 as I was saying it, again, uh, uh, forgive me for saying it, uh, the group does not have the, the political clout to make a difference on an issue as uh, on issues as, as consequential as the ones that we're addressing. That is why we just bypassed the, the Human Relations Commission and went to create a new task force. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that way. The Human Relations Commission ought to be heavyweights that are, it, that are dealing with these issues. And, and, and I'm not picking Human Rights. I can look at, um, for example, the City Plan Commission. When we're dealing with major planning issues in the community, do we turn to the City Planning Commission? No, we do not. We should, but it, but but that group is just an afterthought. Um, again, uh, uh, who, who am I offended? <laughs> Jennifer, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my last meeting this week, so. Okay. The, the truth is, we, we don't always take our boards and commissions seriously enough. And whenever an issue comes up, we create a new task force. When we've got a group like the City Planning Commission that's, that's constituted and have some good folks, of course. But or we're bring we're giving, in. I'm sorry? Zoning and city planning. And also the zoning commission. Building oh. stairs. And, and echoing on what Fernando's saying, I remember when, and, and, and Estrus, you may remember this, when I, we were on the uh, Fort Worth Human Relations Commission, they said pretty much all the council members either came through planning, zoning, or human relations commission to serve, uh, to be a council member. So, you know, that was yeah, then back true. there. So I don't know what it is. Today. These ought to be influential groups, groups. Uh, and if, they, if they're not currently influential, we need to make them influential again. Mm -hmm. so that, and give uh, them the support. Can I get. say one thing? Yes. Um, part of that is, is we're not getting people to apply, so please tell people to apply. Um, you know, like the last few times that we have tried to find people to fill vacancies, there were like two applicants. And so please, you know, get, get those people to apply. If you're interested in applying, if you know someone that should be applying, please have them apply. But probably we also need employers to be supportive. Why would you want to spend time if it's not? Why are you going to waste your time on something that's not consequential? Well, I got a chicken and egg. There's a chicken and egg. There's the other chicken and the egg. Because there's a lot of folks that can't afford to take a day out of work. The current zoning chair for example, has been using vacation time every month to come to our meetings. I was always fortunate and blessed to like, have an employer that saw it as a benefit. Now that I'm consulting independent, and I can do that again. But that's the other aspect of it, too. There has to be 
There's a ton of people that want to. Well, we don't. Can't. We don't meet till five thirty in the evening. Not, well, so that's why you have all boards. Yes, yes, yes. Because they're all throughout the day. Sure, they are. Yeah. Huh. And some take right. longer than others. But we'll, we'll talk about the human we'll relations commission at, at our next meeting. Yeah. And you've given and, us. And maybe that's something that we need to look at is representation on our boards and commissions so that we can see the timing and so forth that go, echoes to what you're saying. But good, bad, or different, if you're going to serve, that's what happens in so many cases. Yeah. And remember, you had a briefing from the city secretary's office uh, several months ago about boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. and, and those boards and yeah. commissions are. Generally speaking, are not reflective of the Communities. population of the community. Now, obviously, the Human Relations Commission should be, but even the Human Relations Commission, do you know how many, Angie, how many African Americans are on the Human Relations Commission today? I'm looking at this right today, now. There's, today, there's two. One, though, has just resigned, so we need an African American. We have one. We have, how large is the commission? Eleven. We have an 11 member commission that's charged with advancing racial equity, and there's one African American. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, well also the other question is... I mean, I'm not blaming anybody, but it's a bad deal. Okay, human corridors and movement partners, so they have African American female that's on there. But then they have positions, so there's only one person per, per position. So that's, the position is the, the, the district, not the district, the... They're not from districts. They, 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 Depends on the, the They represent different slots. They represent different slots. Okay. Number instead of the so ordinance. like city plan commission and zoning commission. We allow that all the time on. I was appointed by the city plan commission. Zoning commission is by district. The human relations commission is not. They're all on board. Yeah. yeah. And their their ordinance says they're supposed to represent the diversity of the city as much as reasonably possible. So I'm going to have to do it right now. So there's only one African American female. American Yeah, he actually took a jolly Dallas and moved to Dallas. So that shows you we've got homework. Again, thank you all for being here, and then we'll see you all next time.